it's not quite 930 and we're in the waiting room is clearing out. So we'll give it just a second longer before we get started. Okay, thank you, Erin. Is uh, Mackenzie Wallace on to call the roll? I don't see her yet, but I do have the list pulled up in front of me just in case. Okay, thank you. We still have several people filing in from the waiting room. Okay, so, thank you, Erin. You're welcome. Good morning, Sheila. <laughs> Good morning, Kathy. How are you? I'm good. Thank you. I think we're gathering our quorum here, so. I get it cleared and it fills right back up. Not that that's a bad thing. <laughs> Right. Hello. Good morning, we can hear you. Okay, I just making sure I came in a little late. Hi, Eric. Welcome. We'll Thank get you. Started here in just a second. What do you think, Aaron? Are we about ready? We are clear. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Good morning. Uh, let's call this meeting of the Medicaid Advisory Council, the MAC, to order. I'm Sheila Schuster. I'm the uh, chair of the MAC. And I don't believe that Mackenzie Wallace, our secretary, is on. So, Aaron, if you would please uh, call the roll. Absolutely. Kelly, are you on to count why I call names? I have a hard time doing both. I know she's had computer issues all week. Okay, I'll do my best to count and name call at the same time. Uh, Beth? Here, and I'm here. Oh, oh, thank you, Kelly. You're welcome. Nina? I'm here. Susan? I'm here, but my video's not working, so I'm going to sign on on my phone and see if I can get the video to work. Thank you. Jerry? Here. Garth? Here. Steve? Here. John? Mueller? Mueller, yes, here. Oh, Mueller, I'm so sorry. I do that every no time. No problem. No problem. <laughs> Eshma? Uh, I saw uh, Dr. Gupta. Did we yeah. leave her? You're just muted. Oh, there she is. Sorry about that. Uh, John Dads? <laughs> Dodds? I think I always say that one wrong as well. Catherine? 
Here. Barry. Kent. Mackenzie. Anissa. Here. Sheila. Here. Brian. Peggy. If that was Brian from Etna, I'm sorry, I'm here. Uh, no, Brian Proctor, Mac member, I'm sorry. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Eric? Here. Okay, that is everyone. Um, Kelly, how many did we have? I think I counted 11. Um, I'm attending on my phone because my laptop's not working, so, but I think we're at 11. We should have a quorum. Okay, thank you very much. Um, the um, minutes of the November 30th meeting were distributed and I would entertain a motion for their approval. I'll make that motion. This is I'll second it. Uh, that was Dinah and the second was? Eric. Eric, thank you very much. Uh, any additions, corrections, omissions? Uh, if not, all of those, I'm sorry. All of those in favor of approving the minutes signify by saying aye. 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 And opposed, like sign, and abstentions. Thank you very much. Let me just remind uh, everyone, we welcome everyone. I think we've got 91 people on the Zoom uh, to keep your... Uh, yourself muted, please, during the meeting, unless you have a speaking role. And the only people that should be speaking uh, should be uh, voting members of the MAC and then uh, staff from DMS and any other uh, government cabinet. So we uh, appreciate that. Uh, if you have a question and you're not a voting member of the MAC, if you want to put it in the chat, we'll try to uh, respond to it. And this meeting is recorded, um, and the recording is posted on the DMS website. Awesome. Watch and listen. Uh, appreciate that. Um, under old business, uh, is Commissioner Lee on? Yes, Dr. Schuster, I am. Oh, great. Good morning. Good uh, morning. was not too difficult this morning. I was very <laughs> glad that most of us were not having to drive anyplace with the fog this morning. So uh, let's start with old business, if we could, Commissioner Lee. And we'll ask, as we always do, about the status of the Anthem MCO. That is still in in uh, in litigation, so we have no updates at this time. OK, thank you. Uh, we had asked for a description of the 1915C waivers the 1915 I spa and then the 1115 waivers. There's been a lot, a lot of action, mm -hmm. as you well know, on all of these waivers and spas. And I don't know who's going to give that description for us. I believe either Pam or Leslie um, will update us or well give us a description of those of those waivers specifically. If, if that's all you all want is a description of those, correct? Yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, Leslie, Pam, Pam. Pam's going to start and then I'll okay. wrap it up. Fantastic, thank you. Yeah, we had asked for a description because we keep talking about the waivers in our TAC reports and here on the MAC, and there were a number of MAC members that felt like it would be very helpful just to get an overall picture of, uh, of the various waivers. So Pam, whenever you're ready. Pam, are you on mute? Or are you? On the I'm. I'm not sure. I see her commissioner. I'm scrolling really quick. Okay. Well, I can give, give a start. I, yeah. Uh, or Leslie, if you I want to, say I can give a start too. Okay. So I think. I'm sorry. Um, is it uh, you're asking about? Um, just the, a description of the waivers. So the 1915C home and community based okay. waivers. So we've got. And, yeah, we've got just. Oh, wait a minute. Oh. I was going to say, I couldn't get myself off mute for whatever reason, but Pam was having some technical difficulties. I think she's trying to come in now, um, but 
Leslie, if you want to go ahead and get yeah, started. Yeah, I can go ahead and get started. So okay. um, on the, as far as the description goes on the 1915C waivers, we have six 1915C waivers. Uh, and Alicia, if I if I need to speak or change anything different, just let us know. Um, our oldest is our uh, overarching HCBS waiver, which is for the elderly and disabled services. And we have a SCL waiver supports for community living. Um, Hello. And we have, Hello. 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 Who's speaking, please? I, I'm sorry, uh, Sarah is not here. Can I help you? Oh. I'm sorry about that, Doctor Schuster. Okay. I got them muted. Thank you. Um, sorry, I'll go back, Doctor Schuster. So we yeah. have a Michelle P. waiver, and that's for uh, folks with intellectual and developmental dis and or dis developmental disabilities, and that does not include a residential component. So our waivers that include the residential component were the SCL waiver that I just mentioned earlier, um, and two ABI waivers. So the two ABI waivers are acquired brain injury waivers. One is kind of considered a rehab waiver, and one's considered a long term care waiver, and both of those have uh, residential components. We have the model waiver too, which is for uh, individuals that are, and it's a small waiver, um, lots of children in that program related to um, ventilator dependency. Um, and I think the only service in that one is uh, nursing um, with a case management component where the nurse is actually the, uh, acts as the case manager as well. We so actually, we, they can actually have a respiratory therapist. Thank, sorry, thank I finally you, was able to get on. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> of I'm course, when I'm first, I get first. I have technical <laughs> difficulties and can't get in. So, um, but you did a good job, Leslie. <laughs> <laughs> so let's let's slow down for a minute for those, those. So the HCBS is your oldest waiver, and that's for the elderly and disabled, and that's in home care. That is, it done. is in home care. Yeah. Yes, yeah, and it's our lar It is our largest waiver. It has um, currently seventeen thousand and fifty slots. Um, and it's also the waiver that we transition the most of our using MFP, we transition the majority of the individuals um, that we transition with MFP come out into that HCB waiver. Okay, and then you mentioned sports for community living, which is your intellectual developmental disabilities folks. And it's very popular because it does have a residential. It does have a residential component, correct. And it has right now um, 4,900, 4, and I don't have the numbers up in front of me, and I swear I would never forget them, about 4,941 slots. Um, there were, um, we have an additional slot, um, 100 slots that will be coming into that that um, are in the waiver that's with CMS right now. Um, but we um, allocate, for those slots, we allocate only um, on an emergency basis. So if someone, and at any point in time, somebody can request emergency status. So that's usually somebody that um, either is wanting to transition out of an ICF or a facility or um, someone that has had, you know, a catastrophic event that has caused them to lose caregivers. Um, so usually those individuals go into a residential setting. We also look at our kids that age out of DCBS um, that fit into that category, um, get those emergency slots. Uh, uh, intermediate care facility, Marcy. Sorry, I forget alphabet soup. And Dr. Schuster, if, if it would be helpful, I have a, sort of a, a Medicaid 101 presentation and I have a section in there specifically related to waivers. I can get that and give it to Aaron to um, distribute to the MAC members if you think that would be helpful after after today's meeting. We also have a waiver 101 that I bet are probably, they're probably it's, the same kind of components yeah. too, but I would be- um, It's on our website. As well, yeah. So. yeah, I can yeah. grab it and put it in the chat. I believe it's on our website. Okay, thank you. You're thank welcome. You, Lisa. We get excited talking about the waivers. I think. <laughs> I've done them for a long time and I I uh, know they're awesome programs. And so I get a little excited talking about them. Mm. Okay, let me go ahead then. Or are you going to, do you want to go over the, did you go over the 1915 I? I'm sorry. I can do the I really quick. Okay. So um, the 1915 I, which is, 
it, it's confusing because it is a state plan amendment, but it provides home and community based services. So it's going to be for individuals um, that have serious mental illness, um, as well as there are some services for individuals with substance use disorder. Um, it the most exciting thing about that right now. Um, we've been working on it. Um, we just finished town halls at the end of last year and on Monday that spa um, is going out for public comment. It will be posted for public comment. Um, as well as there will be a companion that goes out that kind of helps with the review of it. It's, you know, it's a template. It's it's something that, you know, they, CMS, we have to go into the portal and it's specific the way we have to fill it out. So sometimes it can be hard knowing where you want to go if you're, if you're looking for something in particular or um, how to review that. So we try to release that companion guide that helps know if you're wanting to look for, you know, services in particular, or you're wanting to look at something in particular, um, exactly where to go in the document. But um, that is on track and will be posted for public comment on Monday, the 29th. And it, so it will be our newest of the um, home and community based, um, our long-term services and supports, but it is a state plan amendment. Okay, mm -hmm. I'm going to go over the um, 1115s that we currently have. I think I'm just going to start a little bit backwards and just say that the 1915I state plan amendment is a companion to the recently submitted SMI 1115 waiver, um, which is it's a little bit of a play on waiver. The, the waiver on our on the 1115 side is really allowing for flexibilities of folks um, in a demonstration period. And so um, we have this as a companion that will include a really more of a parity for the additional uh, st days stay in an IMD more than 15 days and then an average stay of 30 in the state of Kentucky, as well as a recuperative care piece that allows for a safe place for folks to go um, if they need um treatment or prep before surgery. Oftentimes these are folks that are homeless and don't have a clean, safe place to stay uh, during medical procedures before and after. So this is called recuperative care. Um, in the federal world, we often see it called a medical respite as well. So right now there's no new updates to the SMI 1115 that was submitted. DMS uh, is reviewing currently right now a playbook that's called the Medical Respite Playbook, which is a practical guideline for managed care plans. And that was released by the National Institute for Medical Respite. So we're kind of doing a deep dive in, into that Medical Respite Playbook that came out in fall of 2023. Um, going back to our overarching Team Kentucky, which also includes our substance use disorder uh, expansion uh, and extension, um, those things we have not heard back from CMS. We meet with them on a regular basis every month. Um, we were also, I think, uh, Dr. Schuster, um, we mentioned at the Behavioral Health Tag that um, DMS um, hosted CMS to come here. They asked to come and see what we're doing. We did a very integrative, collaborative uh, meeting, included other partners, other sister agencies. A Department of Behavioral Health was present and kind of went over all the wonderful things we've got going on here in the state of Kentucky, and they were very impressed with us according to their emails back, um, and have also asked DMS to come present with them at CMS's uh, quality conference in April. So we'll be, um, Angela Sparrow and I will be presenting with CMS at their quality conference, which is a really big deal, and we're very uh, happy that they could see all the good things that are going on here in the state of Kentucky. Um, we are doing annual monitoring and reporting. Our next uh, monitoring reporting of our big overarching Team Kentucky 1115 is due to CMS in February. Um, and again, there's no new updates regarding the extension other than we've been working through uh, any questions that they might have, which have, has been minimal at this time, um, and trying to figure out, CMS is trying to figure this out as well, how we can streamline all these requests that all states have, not just Kentucky, and to get them approved in as, as quickly as we can. They were a little bit backed up after COVID and had 52, I think, to get through before the end of uh, December the 31st. 
Um, our other waiver that we've got going on right now is the re-entry 1115. That is actually an arm off of our Team Kentucky because it will be for more than um, members who have SUD. So we, um, with our submission of the re-entry 1115, um, December the 30th, we got that out a, a day early. We were bound to determine to meet our own our own deadlines. Um, DMS withdrew that old pending incarceration amendment from three years ago because it was not going to be approved um, as it was. And we've had many states to reach out asking us questions about it. So in all transparency for other states too that are trying to um, right waivers, we uh, withdrew the old incarceration and submitted the new re-entry, which is the same opportunity. Uh, CMS now calls it the re-entry application, um, and that was submitted on 1230. Our public comment ran through November through 12 December the 9th. Um, and uh, we had about 13 comments that you can find posted on our website. Um, DMS did receive um, about 15 days or less after we sent the application to CMS, a letter that says that we meet all the completeness, they call it a completeness, completeness letter of an 1115, and said that we included all information that was needed in all required fields for the application. So once it's deemed complete, uh, it is posted to Medicaid.gov for a federal public comment, which will run through 12, I'm sorry, February the 11th. So we are waiting uh, to see uh, what's going to happen there. Now, remember, even if CMS approves it, this just starts the implementation plan. So our advisory work group will kick off first quarter of the year. So we're very excited to get that started. That will be involved in our implementation plan that will be that will be submitted to CMS as well. So we've got lots of moving parts for lots of complementary programs to others, as well as trying to meet all the needs uh, of individuals that we've got here in Kentucky. I do want to mention uh, one caveat on the re-entry waiver. It is not now, it's not only for adults, we are asking for juveniles to be covered as well. So that's a that's a very positive. Um, from re incarceration waiver to re-entry waiver now, we had to narrow the eligibility, or sorry, we expanded the eligibility for folks and we had to narrow the, the um, services. We hope to get this approved. We already have a list of changes we wanna make as soon as we start, as soon as we get the approval. We want something that we can build upon and to get this through at a very busy time that uh, CMS has so many uh, other waivers that are out there from states to review. And I probably spoke really fast. I'm sorry, Dr. Schuster. Yes, ma'am. Sure. No, I'm, I'm sorry. sorry. Make I'm sorry. Does, does someone have a question? <laughs> Nina. Um, will you repeat what you said about the IMD and the 15 day? That was I didn't quite grab that. Yeah. So currently, right now on the SUD waiver, which we are we have um embedded with the extension for Team Kentucky. Um, we wanted to do something related to SMI and parity, and that would give us uh, 15 days per stay, and then I could also include uh, an average stay of, um, of 30 for the state. So it's an average stay. And so that doesn't have anything to do with what happens to provider payments after the 15 days of care, if it goes to day 16, 17. So we can cover an average stay of 30. That's why I was trying. I know that's a little confusing. So some might have more and some might have less. So it's, we can't go over an average stay of 30 days for Kentucky. And we monitor that. Okay, that's great. Some of the um, MCOs are clawing back all 15 days if the patient goes to day 16 or beyond. Okay. And so we have made the um, MCOs aware that we've got this um uh, pending with CMS. And again, it was more, we wanted to make that happen. Um, it was available under that authority that we were already sending this application for. And then it really did seem like parity since we have uh, that availability for SUD already. Perfect. Thank you. I'm sorry, this is Erin with the Department of Medicaid. If I could step in for just a moment, I'm not sure if it's just on my end but I'm getting a lot of feedback, static, and noise. So if you're not speaking, if you don't mind, please mute, uh, just in case anyone else is also having issues hearing. Thank, Thank you, you. Aaron. 
I'm not having that problem, but uh, if you are, then we want to be sure that that's uh, taken care of. Thank you. Uh, Leslie, on the reentry, you're going to cover adults and juveniles now. You mentioned it was SUD. Does it also cover people with SMI? Yes, it yeah. will cover dual diagnose, uh, dual diagnosis as well. So um, okay. there's actually some physical health pieces in there. And we've been working also as a sideline, Dr. Schuster, with the Department of Public Health and others to try to see if we can address um, um, increases of hep C uh, here in Kentucky. Good. So working, we're working to uh, see if we can assist with that, feeling that if we could cover uh, those services uh, during incarceration, they could uh, get at least some of their treatment started uh, before they leave. So um, that's just a sidebar. But all the medications that we are going to ensure that they have when they leave um, with a 30 day supply medication also includes physical health medications. So it's it's kind of a variety of it's really about extensive um, care coordination um um, MAT, uh, MAT, I'm trying to think of the other things, and then 30-day supply, and then we're also working through some recovery residential support services um, for people in a location. If you're familiar with Senate Bill 90, we're trying to assist with some of those pieces as well. Well, and you might just mention to people what happens, what happens now if, if people are incarcerated and they have Medicaid. So currently right now, we are a lucky state in that we suspend, we don't terminate. So we were progressive doing that in the past. Um, their leave dates are often fluid. Uh, don't know exactly what date that they're leaving. So we're trying to narrow that down and, and do a better job in figuring out when folks are leaving. And we, this is not just something we're doing. DOC and AOC and other folks are, and DJJ are also here in Kentucky involved with us. So the Department of Corrections and Justice, sorry about the acronyms. Um, but we want to ensure that they have a warm handoff when they're ready to, um, to to leave incarceration or confinement for the juvenile justice, that they've got all their appointments set up and ready to go through intensive care coordination so that they can be successful and have everything set up when they leave. So there's nothing lacking. We want to ensure that 30-day supply of medication because oftentimes crisis happens after they leave. Uh, when when they don't have medication or can't uh, obtain the medication very quickly. So we want to ensure that that is taken care of. The MCO of their choice will be involved with them. We are asking for 60 days prior to release, and then they will do a post follow -up, intensive follow-up for 12 months is what we're asking for. Yeah, so it really changes the entire um, experience for those that are incarcerated. Very much they so. they will be able to get Medicaid benefits while they, those 60 days before yeah. they're released, and then lots of work to make sure they don't fall off the cliff once they get in. I'm so glad to hear you're going to address the Hep C because we've heard from the Department for Public Health their concerns about that. Yeah, um, I'm trying to see. I think we can figure something out. I don't know if it'll be what everybody wants first round, but um, we definitely want to try to address that for Kentucky because I, um, from what I hear, it is a, an increasing situation here in Kentucky. So we want to try to assist with that and and see what we can do um, for prevention. Thank you. And Garth, you've been very uh, patient. You've had your hand up. Do you have a question? Uh, just a, a question. I got a phone call uh, just the other day, and I said I I do not know. So I would I said I, we've got this MAC meeting coming up. I said the 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 folks that will know will know, and they'll be on this meeting. Uh, but I got a call about uh, in the northern Kentucky area about uh, our illegal immigrants qualifying through a waiver system or through the MCOs to get orthodontic treatment. Hey, Dr. Brabowski, this is uh, Lisa Lee. Um, we do have a citizenship requirement in Medicaid and um only individuals who meet certain criteria related to um, eligibility can get in the program. So if an undocumented immigrant is applying for Medicaid, they most likely will not will qualify that we do have an exception for legally residing immigrants who have been in the state for five years for children. 
Um, so if they are an undocumented immigrant, they would not qualify for Medicaid. Okay. Well, thank you. I just thought I'd get an answer from this group. <laughs> thank you. There is also a um, question in the chat from Lori Gordon. It says, how are the MCOs notified of the upcoming DOC release? So that's a question, I guess, for Leslie. But we do have, and I will, I, I can chime in and then oh. Leslie can enter. Uh, but we do have a, um, a, a, a data feed, if you will, uh, I think it's from APRIS, and it comes into our computer when an individual is incarcerated. Uh, we get an incarceration status when that individual is released, and that that would be removed. There is a, sometimes a little bit of a lag, but for the, for the most part, I think this works very well, so we do have those notifications. We do have um, some instances, for example, where an individual may be released, um, let's say today. They go to the physician today. Um, the physician checks everything is okay. Uh, but when they file their claim, that claim is denied because the systems haven't talked to each other yet to inform um, the either the MCO that um, the individual who has been incarcerated has been released. And we have a, a process whereby we work through those cases. But we do have data feeds that show incarceration status in our system, and that is passed to the managed care organizations. Leslie, I'm not sure if you have if you want to add anything to that. I was just going to say that that's what I was going to talk about was APRIS. And um, we we have, because we've been involved uh, with APRIS and trying to figure out how we can make things better, uh, we have noticed that the um, accuracy of AP APRIS has definitely gotten a lot better. And um, it's it's going to be a good tool for us to utilize. Um, I will tell, and, and folks know that I say this before, I've said this before, if you have a member um, that's in a situation where they're out and they can right, like right now and they can't get their Medicaid turned back on. Um, I, I work through a couple of those um, a month and we've got wonderful folks in Medicaid that assist with their eligibility. So if you run into one of those situations, I totally don't mind for you to to reach out to me and, and we will work through those. I used to have about six, probably six or seven a month. And now I probably just get one or two. Um, I haven't had any for January. Thank you. And Commissioner Lee, uh, Dr. Gupta um, asked if you would review again the, what you said about the um, legally residing kids. And do they need to be here for five years before they're eligible for Medicaid? I think that was her question. Yes, there is a five year bar. We will have to go. I can go back and look specifically at um, our eligibility policy. But yes, there is a, a five year bar on legally residing uh, immigrants. However, uh, for children, we waive that five-year bar. So okay. legally residing children can um, enroll in the program. But again, it's legally residing. Um, but typically there is a five-year bar. But years and years ago, when we made changes to our CHIP program, we changed that and eliminated that five-year bar for children. Thank you. And Leslie, there was a question in the chat about, could you again review the services that are offered uh, two people in those sixty those last sixty days of incarceration before they are so, released. Yes, ma'am. So here's what we're asking for in that waiver. If CMS approves it, we're asking for case management, which it's not just simple case management. We're expecting some pretty intensive case management, and then also the case management would also continue once the person leaves for a twelve month follow up. So that's something extra that we're asking for for support of the member. MAC coverage 60 day prior to release, 30 day supply of medications at time of release. Um, and that also includes, remember, the physical and uh, other mental health issues, um, coverage, sorry, medication, as well as I think there's some durable medical equipment also listed in there. And then we're also working on uh, recovery, residential support services. If you see RRSS acronym out there in the world, it's, it's recovery, resident support services up to three months yeah. post release. Uh, and we're working on that through Senate Bill 90. I always talk about that because I really feel like it's an avenue that is a compliment again uh, to try to assist uh, these individuals. And then also we're covering a confinement of uh, uh, yeah. DJJ individuals, the juvenile justice population. Dr. Schuster, you're muted. 
Thank you, Leslie. Um, I'm assuming that there also are active treatment programs going on for either the mental illness that's been identified or the substance use disorder besides Correct. Medication. Correct. Right. And that's one of the, we, we want to ensure that the assessment is completed that can identify any of those needs through care coordination, um, whether it be mental, physical, uh, the SUD uh, uh, situation, or um, like I said, the hep C, that's, that's another one we want to figure out a way that we can identify and then possibly start uh, treatment while they're there. Okay. And more to come, Dr. Schuster, like I said, I've, I've had, <laughs> I I've already, I've gotten multiple comments uh, about, can we add this? Can we add that? Can you look at this? Can you look at that? And we can, um, I, one of the main things right now is we're trying to get that approval from CMS so that we can build, I don't want to have any questions that delays us getting a, an approval right now in the midst of their 52 reviews of other states. So, Well, and for those of us who have been uh, on this uh, journey with you for what the past five years? Yeah, three, you are very three anxious. At least, yeah. yeah, yes, you are I very am too. anxious mm -hmm. for this to get uh, approved. I'm sure you are too. Yes, yes. Uh, one quick question because I lost my internet there for a few minutes while you were talking. Um, I saw that the notice went out that the um, 30 day public comment period on the 1915 I spa is going to start. Uh, January 29th. Yes, I think, Pam, did you, it was yes. the 29th, is that yeah, correct? Yeah, it it's Monday, so it's it's yeah. this upcoming Monday, it starts. Yeah, and it'll was, open, um, we actually are, because of, of um, leap year, and so I think we're actually leaving it open an extra day or so, I think it closes on um, the 20, I think we left it open through the 20, um, the 29th, or, um, so I think it's, it's actually open maybe for a little over 30 days, but um, it does, it will start on Monday. <clears throat> Great. And uh, the actual uh, spa will be available for people to review to make their comments on, right, Pam? Yes. Yeah, so it will be, so we will send out a, um, once it is posted, Kelly will send out the notification of where, um, where to find it, the link of where to find it on the website. Um, and as well as there's the directions on the various ways you can make public comment. Um, we even, we have staff that are available, but if someone, um, you know, doesn't want to send in written comment, either through email or, you know, through regular mail, we have staff that they can call and they will actually take down the comment for them. Um, and well, submit. That's, that's wonderful. I would, I could picture some of our consumers and family members using that. That's really, that's really great. Yeah, um, so we, we really wanted to make it be available any way, you know, every way possible for individuals to be able to comment. So we didn't want to have right. any barriers. And when you uh, post that, will you be posting a, a summary of what's in there? Yes. Because that's a we lot of pages. That. Yes, that's we will have that. That's a lot of pages that. for people to plow through. It is. It's a lot of pages and it's it's not in the, you know, it's, it's, it's in a format that we have to use. So um, it's not the most user friendly to read right. through. So there will be a summary that um, individuals can look at and see, you know, it'll guide them to where, um, you know, if there's a specific section or specific thing that they want to look for, it'll guide them there as well as kind of guide them through the document. Wonderful. And will you post your FAQs along with it? Because I think that's a super helpful uh, way for people that are not as familiar with the waiver to uh, look at those Yes, Question there is an updated version of those actually that is, I believe this afternoon we are going through them one last time and then the updated version of those also will be posted. Fantastic. Thank you very much. You're making Dr. Schuster, I would just mention, like Pam said, the, the version, the way it is, it's not real friendly. It's not like your, it's not going to be your typical C that you're used to looking at, right? It's a 1915C. It's going to look different and it's complex. And it's complex because we're trying to meet the need of a, uh, a wide range, right? So it's right. going it, to, it's, right. it's complex. So I would do what Pam says and just suggest to your members to, um, to, to look at the, the quicker, quicker, like this section, that section and the summaries that she's talking about, uh, and the upcoming FAQs, because it is, it is confusing. It just is because of, um, how complex that we've, we've asked, um, to meet everybody's needs. Yeah, thank you. And I, I, I keep calling it, of course, the SMI waiver because that's how it started out. But it as, actually is for people with severe mental illness as well as people with 
substance use disorders. Yeah. And uh, you all in the town hall meetings did a good job of talking through which services were available for which of those populations. Yeah. So very exciting. It's all kind of coming together now, finally. So yeah, we're very excited. Great. All right. Any other questions from any of the um, voting members? I see that a couple people, Aaron, have, have logged in, Barry Martin and Kent Gilbert. Welcome. Um, Dr. Right. Schuster, I had yeah. one question and, sure. and it's just to educate myself because um, as we all know, substance use disorder, when they're being discharged from the from jail, you know, from a jail or being incarcerated is so important. You said that they were just, just going to be kind of put on hold while they're incarcerated, but then their Medicaid number would start as soon as they were discharged. Is that process pretty seamlessly? Because you want to make sure when they hit that door and need those medications, they're going to be active at the pharmacy. So level. Currently, right now, and this has been a while back, um, the state actually went to a suspension rather than termination. So they're not okay. terminated now, but it has not been an easy process or a timely process. Um, and there's many factors to that. It's just not, it's not just Medicaid. It's the notification that, that they've, you know, they've left and, or what I said earlier, we have found that their leave is very fluid. Like you might not think that they're going to leave for 30 days and then the last week they're combining, you know, all their uh, good time reductions or their time that they've already, in, you know, served and things like that. And oftentimes um, members might get out earlier than we even expect them to because mm -hmm. they haven't calculated. So um, it's just kind of fluid right now. So that's what the okay. system um, is working on. But I tell people now, even before this gets started, we occasionally might have a member who leaves and cannot get their Medicaid turned back on. So I've just been telling folks just to reach out. And like I said, I used to do that probably about six of those a month. I, I don't think I had any in December. Actually, I don't remember any since Thanksgiving. So it's been a while since I've even worked on one. Okay. So I just it's definitely curious. getting better. Yeah. yeah. Well, um, that's good. I've heard that that was one barrier for yeah. many patients in the pharmacies, you know, trying to find out how they're going to take care of those patients. So exactly. thank you. And, and we found that that can cause crisis as well um, yes. when leaving, right? Very soon thereafter. And that's something that we yes. are trying to prevent is crisis and any reason that they may have issues uh, coming out. So thank you. Thank you. And you mentioned, Leslie, that they are released with 30 days medication supply. That is correct. And um, that includes physical health as well. So there's uh, anything that's addressed in that care management assessment, we're going to try to see if we can get identified and then uh, leave. And I think even durable medical equipment and things like that can be covered. And one final question in the chat. Um, who is billed for those in jails or in prison services? Is it the MCO or is it Medicaid directly? So right now, what's I think what's going to be uh, what what will happen is is that the jail will be able to bill the Medicaid services, um, and then pharmacy uh, will also be able to bill. The current pharmacy for DJJ and DOC happens to already be a Medicaid provider, so that was not a hard lift at all. I was actually worried about that side, and it was not a hard lift at all to to figure out how to make that happen. So um, they're already currently a Medicaid provider. Okay, so it's Medicaid while they're in incarcerated, and then they're hand off to the MCO. That's correct. When they leave leave the prison. That's correct. Okay, thank you. All right. Well, that was a lengthy discussion, but uh, these waivers are so incredibly uh, important. Uh, we have a big campaign going to address the waiting list for the 1915 C waivers because there's over 12,000 people on those, and the House budget had actually funding for more um, 1915C waiver slots than we've ever seen before. The funding is in there for 2,550 slots. Uh, I think that's maybe 10 times, certainly five times as many slots as we've ever seen in a, in a budget. So we're excited about that. Um, let's go on to the next, which is that um, several of the MCOs in their presentations mentioned a 2% withhold to meet the uh, HEDIS quality measures. And I'm wondering if this is a change in the contract for 2024 between Medicaid and the MCOs. 
Uh, yes, Dr. Schuster, Lisa Lee, yes. This is a, a change in the contract. Um, as many of you may know, Kentucky has uh, one of the lowest rates of uninsured in the country. We're below the national average with you know, over, a little over 1.5 million enrolled in Medicaid, another 75,000 enrolled in their QHP. And as such, you know, the, the MCOs cover 90% of our Medicaid population. And um, we have a priority to not only enroll individuals in the program to make sure, but to also make sure that their health status is improved. And we do have several quality measures, for example, in our hospital reimbursement improvement program and our outpatient reimbursement improvement program. And hospitals receive supplemental payments uh, if they meet certain quality measures. Uh, we are also doing that in the managed care contracts. We have value-based uh, payment for those uh, for those uh, managed care organizations. We do withhold two percent of the of their capitation payment once they meet certain quality measures. They can receive uh, those those funds back. We also have a bonus uh, pool measure. So we have uh, about five or six uh, core measures, which includes um, uh, HB, you know, good control of their A1C, um, their their diabetes, um, you know, related to diabetes. We also have a child child and adolescent well care visits from three to twenty one years of age. Uh, some uh, measures around childhood immunizations uh, and other postpartum care and social needs screening and interventions. Those are some core measures. We also have a bonus pool measure, which includes uh, you know, metabolic metabolic monitoring for children and adolescents uh, on anti-psychotic uh, medications and a few other uh, measures that are bonus pool. So uh, if they meet certain measures, they will be able to receive um, those bonus funds back. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, could we get a list from you of those yes. quality measures that you just mentioned? Yes, we will provide that. And then again, they will be spelled out in the 2024 contract. So, but we will get those uh, measures to you and, um, or get them to Erin and she can All send right. them out to the rest of the, the MAC and TAC members. Yeah, that would be great. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. And uh, the final question, this came up a little bit at our last meeting, uh, changes in telehealth. And I think there were some questions about the federal versus the state flexibilities. Yeah, and uh, I think Jonathan Scott may be um, on the line. I'll have him address this. You know, Medicaid, uh, Kentucky Medicaid has always had a pretty flexible telehealth um, uh, uh, policies. And so I'm not sure. I, I think ours actually mirror the federal uh, regulations or statutes. I don't I don't know if there's any major discrepancies. I know that we at one point, you know, we could not we were waiting on information related to non HIPAA compliant platforms such as FaceTime and that sort of thing to for uh, the federal government to make a decision if we could continue to use those platforms. But um, I'll let Jonathan speak to uh, to the to the telehealth. Good morning, everyone, and and good morning, uh, Commissioner. Uh, we uh, we are not aware of anything that that we're doing that is is uh, additionally restrictive. Uh, if it's uh, within the scope of licensure and scope of practice, uh, the, the general rule of thumb is that it is allowed. Uh, the the, um, the, um, the there are a couple of uh, federal restrictions that we're starting to see. Um, uh, with uh, I, I think uh, I think there was some uh, uh, hos hospital uh, um, uh, partial hospitalization issues that that had that had uh, gone on. Uh, we, we are our our hands are are pretty tied uh, with a lot of these things where we just have to kind of uh, you know either follow the billing code if that's involved or uh, follow the federal restrictions. We're, we're trying to be as um, as open as possible. That's uh, that, that's how our reg is written. That's how we have interpreted uh, these statutes that have passed as well. Um, and Garth, you had a question. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, going back on the uh, the four C and under old business, I just had a question on. Yeah. Uh, and Commissioner Lee, if you it don't have to do it right now, but just uh, if you could get us some information on the the bonus system for the MCOs on uh, that Medicaid provides to them, and 
what qualifies them to, you know, get a bonus. Uh, uh, more, I, I'm assuming it would be related to health improvements. Um, but if it just, I just need a little information there, please. Yeah, yeah, it might be it might be helpful at the next um, meeting uh, to uh, let um, Angie or someone on her team provide a little bit of a of a, a presentation on how that withhold works because it's not really a a, a bonus uh, as so in so much as it is part of their already. Um, uh, capitation payment that we pay, we withhold 2% of their capitation payment. So they have to uh, um, meet certain measures in order to get that funding back. Um, if they don't meet measures, the, that money that is left over goes into a bonus pool. And then if the other MCOs meet um, some of the quality measures they can draw from that bonus pool, but it, it is not going to exceed the capitation payment that they would have received had this 2% withhold not been um, in place, if that makes sense. Does that help, yes. Dr. Yes, yes, thank you very much. Yes. yes, okay. Yeah, okay. I think that's a, a great idea, Commissioner. Thank you. Let's put that on the agenda for March that we'll have a presentation about the, um, the withhold, the contracts, uh, the requirements on the uh, quality measures. I think there are good questions about that. Uh, Nina has her hand up. I do. Um, Jonathan, you were talking about the telehealth for partial hospitalization programs, um, not being restricted if in scope of licensure and scope of practice. What about intensive outpatient programs? Hi, hi Nana, it's Lisa. I can answer that. Hi, Lisa. Uh, so we had a, a conversation and uh, we had a, uh, um, a meeting with uh, some representatives from KHA related to the changes in um, maybe hospital to home, if we want to call it that, where hospitals can deliver services to individuals in their home. We, there was some flexibilities in the uh, public health emergency and we are looking to see what those uh, um, services look like outside of the public health emergency. So we did have a call with CMS and they asked um, what services, for example, um, in IOP specifically, um, how the providers would meet uh, the criteria outlined in the ASAM level of care. So I have reached out to um, a representative, I think Rosmond, uh, I reached out to Rosmond with some questions yesterday. And I'm sorry if I didn't copy you on that email, I'll be more than happy to forward that to you. Uh, but we are looking at that IOP piece to, and specifically uh, working with CMS to see, um, you know, answer some of their questions and then to see if if we can either continue with the IOP as it was in the um, implemented in the public health flexibilities, or if we would need to do a waiver or some other um, uh, change to allow those services to be delivered in that in that setting. Thank you. That must be why Rosman scheduled a meeting with me this afternoon. <laughs> I yeah, believe so it is. <laughs> just that's say. it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I was going to jump in and say I went ahead and forwarded it to her so you don't have to worry about it, Commissioner okay. Lee. But thank you okay. uh, very much. Thank for, you. No, thanks. All right. Any other questions on telehealth? Oh, thank you very much, Jonathan. Um, Commissioner Lee, we're ready for updates. I oh, suspect you have some. I, I do have some updates. I, I, I used I had quite a few at, at one point, but um, I, I guess what I would really like to go into is, um, you know, uh, we have an opportunity in these next four years to really make a difference in um, in the lives of those we serve. So that's one reason that we talked about the bonus pool. We've talked about the hospital reimbursement improvement program and the outpatient reimbursement improvement program. And so going back and looking Looking at the over the past four years at some of the things that we have done um, in Medicaid, um, we we've looked at some of our, our accomplishments. And, and I have to say, I've been in Medicaid about 23 years. And these past four years, I have seen some of the most exciting uh, changes in our program. So, for example, this is not an all inclusive list, but we have eliminated uh, all copays in the Medicaid program um, over the past four years. We we no longer have uh, copays in the program. We um, combined our K chip 
uh, benefits or, or, or um, if you, if you, uh, it was totally seamless and we didn't make a big deal about it. But before um, uh, these past four years, all K chip programs, we had two se two separate programs. We had a Medicaid expansion chip, and we had a separate chip. And those children in the separate chip didn't receive the same benefits that the children in the expansion chip received. Um, for example, they did not receive the EPSDT benefit, which include, included some school-based services. They did not include non-emergency medical transportation. So when we combined those, um, those programs into one Medicaid expansion, we did a couple of things. We gave every single child now in the Medicaid and CHIP program has absolute access to every single benefit available. Uh, we also shored up a little bit. I'm, you know, if you're aware of the CHIP program, it's so embedded in Medicaid that a lot of people don't realize that CHIP is actually a, um, a, a, a grant that has to be renewed ever so often. In the event we run out of those CHIP funds, we would have to pay for all of those CHIP kids in that separate program at 100% state general fund dollars. So by moving them into that Medicaid expansion, if we run out of CHIP funds, now we can draw down that Medicaid match rate for those CHIP kids. So the main uh, reason that we combined those programs was to give children the exact same access to benefits. Um, we also, um, in the last four years, have our single preferred drug list. This means that everybody in the Medicaid program, regardless if they are in a managed care organization uh, or in our fee-for-service population, have access to the same uh, prescription drugs. We also implemented a single pharmacy benefit manager. Again, this means that um, pharmacies no longer had to go through six different pharmacy benefit managers, depending on um, the MCO in which a member was enrolled. They now have the one single PBM. We have Im implemented a program of all-inclusive care for the elderly. Uh, this is a program that is not only accessible to Medicaid members, it's also accessible to individuals in Medicare and individuals who um have private insurance. This is a, a a program again, just like Medicaid. This pace is is very similar to a managed care organization in which that pace organization receives a capitated payment to take care of the individuals in their program, and it is designed to keep individuals in their home and community, um, much like our 1915C waivers, rather than in a, a nursing facility. We also have gotten our mobile crisis spa approved, and I think you've heard uh, Leslie Hoffman talk about that mobile crisis spa, spa state plan amendment and some of the uh, benefits we, we're going to hope to see out of that within the next few years. We have uh, uh, received approval for a treat no transport state plan amendment. So what this means is prior to that change, ambulance providers had to pick up somebody and take them to a hospital in order to receive payment. Now, uh, an ambulance provider can uh, go to an individual, somebody calls 911, for example, that ambulance provider can go. They can provide treatment on site and bill Medicaid for that treatment. They will not get transport, but they will get uh, treat payment for that treatment on site. We have also uh, received approval for treat triage and transport. So this means that an ambulance provider can pick up an individual and maybe treat them on site and say, well, you probably should go to your doctor. You should go to a um, an urgent care center or you could go to a behavioral health hospital. So now that ambulance provider can transport those individuals to the appropriate treatment location rather than having to send them or treat them to uh, at a hospital based provider. We have increased our psychiatric residential treatment facility rates. We have two levels of psychiatric residential treatment facilities. Uh, they now receive uh, level one is a $500 reimbursement. Level six is $600 reimbursement. And this is um, aligning with our um, priorities to ensure that we have a good continuum of uh, behavioral health services uh, for our children. Uh, we know, for example, that we have some high acuity youth that we're having uh, difficult placements for. I'm sure that you all have, um, you know, heard on the news um, and read in papers that we have had some children who had to stay in our DCBS offices because there was no treatment place. They, uh, some of them may have been staying in hotels. So this is one step in 
us uh, building out that continuum of care for our youth to make sure that they all have a place to stay in an appropriate form of treatment. We've also talked about a little bit of our hospital reimbursement improvement program. Our hospitals have been paying um, the, uh, the match for this program. It allows us to pay the hospitals the average commercial rate. Uh, they receive this payment, uh, these payments and supplemental payments um, at the, at, I think, quarterly. Uh, but that's bringing more money to our hospitals, and it has been uh, responsible for helping some of our, uh, our rural hospitals stay open. We also uh, have started covering non-emergency medical transportation for methadone treatment in the past four years. We had, um, for some reason, when uh, the um, our behavioral health program uh, was expanded, that uh, treatment for uh, the transportation for NEMT for methadone was not included. We are now covering that. Uh, we have enhanced our vision, dental, and hearing services for adults. We've extended postpartum coverage for pregnant women for 12 months. We've also included pregnant women in our CHIP program now, which allows us to enroll uh, uh, women up to 218% of the federal poverty level in our program. We have continuous eligibility for children, which means that children who come into our program now will have 12 months of continuous eligibility, regardless if there is a change in, cir in circumstance that would have meant they would have bis been disenrolled without this uh, approval from CMS. We are um, uh, reimbursing for community health workers. We have a uh, home and community-based rate study and pay increases um, that I think Pam had talked just a little bit about. We are going through unwinding from the public health emergency. We have a children's uh, waiver feasibility study. And of course, you all have recently heard about the, the 1115 reentry and SMI at the beginning of this um, this uh, meeting. Um, and in in our enhanced vision, dental, and hearing over uh over 1900 adults have received glasses oh, oh wait is that did i say i think over 119000 individuals 119000 adults now have glasses that would not have otherwise had those we have um, 66,658 members have received dental services. That's in the form of another cleaning or dentures or a root canal or a crown. Uh, we have over 18,000 individuals who have received hearing services. And again, this is not an all-inclusive list of everything that we have done in the past four years, but I just wanted to say a big thank you to the MAC uh, members and the and the TAC members for everything that they have done to help push all of those changes forward. We could not have done this without um, all of our partners and our advocacy communities, the legislators, and, and the Secretary of the Cabinet and Governor Bashir. We could not have made all of these significant changes. And so we're very excited for the next four years and uh, another term with Governor Bashir and how we can move that health care needle to actually show that we are improving the health status of our state. Uh, our recently, we have um, moved from 43rd to 41st in America's health rankings. And I think within the next four years, um, if we keep on this trajectory, we should be able to see uh, some more movement. I mean, how great would it be in four years if we could be up in the 30s rather than than in, you know, at 41st? And I know when I first started um, in Medicaid, I think we were 48th or 49th. And in my tenure, I've seen us move up to 47th and 45th and then 43rd. So we are making those uh, changes um, to to improve the lives of those we serve. And again, it's a it's a team effort and, uh, you know, Team Kentucky. Uh, just, just really appreciate everybody who has had um, input and helped us drive those policy changes. And I think that's a very positive update and I will be more than happy to take any questions. And I think we ought to uh, break out some champagne. <laughs> uh, but it's hard to do that remotely. That is yes. a very impressive list. Uh, and there's some uh, comments in the in the chat. Do any of the voting members of the MAC have any specific questions to ask Commissioner Lee? I think we've asked you before to give us that in writing, Commissioner, because you gave us a that rundown at the VH TAC and uh, you ought to write I, it up and put it on gold paper or something. I have it. I have it in a PowerPoint presentation and I will give it to Erin and she can send it out to the Mac and TAC. And, you yeah. know, in, in my presentation, and I think, you know, at the end, I, I don't want to say just thank you, but a big thank you to everyone who has, um, 
has pushed for these changes again. I mean, it it has these changes have been involved. Um, you know, we had legislators involved, and from from both sides of the aisle, we had bipartisan support on a lot of these changes. Um, we had our max and our tax pushing for those changes, particularly, you know, our community health workers, our vision, our dental, our hearing. Uh, none of this could have happened if we had not all been uh, had that one focus of improving the health status of this state. And and I think, you know, it's just these past four years have been so, um, I think, rewarding uh, for me and the Medicaid team to see how everybody has pulled together um, to to be able to get individuals enrolled, keep them enrolled, and make sure that they can um, continue to access services. Now, everything has not been perfect, and uh, we are are definitely excited about the next four years and what we can improve upon. And some of the um, uh, the TAC recommendations, for example, that are coming forth, um, uh, really getting excited about those. For example, the Consumers Rights TAC has made a recommendation that we create a form to allow people, um, Medicaid members, uh, to to document when they have trouble accessing services. Uh, so we've looked at our um, our presumptive eligibility form that we had online uh, during the public health emergency that was very simple. And we're thinking we can kind of follow that format and have that information go into some sort of database so that we can actually start identifying where those access uh, to care issues are. And so very excited about some of those recommendations. And again, that, that's what, you know, the, the MAC and the TAC are for is to, to identify areas of concern and see how we can improve our healthcare delivery um, uh, system and Im improve um, all, you know, just, just make Kentucky a healthier, healthier place. So very excited about some of the things that we see that that'll be coming in the future. Thank you very much. Uh, one of them that you mentioned at the BH TAC, and I don't know that you mentioned it, was the number of uh, spas that were submitted oh. successfully. And I think that's our very own Aaron Vickers and Kelly Sheets. Yes, it is. For and that. So I want to give them a very positive uh, shout out. I, I think it, we, ha we have 20. Yeah, we over 20 state plan amendments impacting Medicaid, two uh, K-CHIPS uh, state plan amendments, four directed payments, and all of those were submitted and approved in, in 2023. And I mean, over 20, we haven't done that many, and I, I couldn't remember how, yeah, there's no way that that was just a monumental task. But the one thing that Kelly and Aaron um, did is you know they always reached out to CMS when we had a state plan amendment and we had conversations and CMS was a great partner on this, as everyone knows that that Medicaid is a public, um, it's a uh, a partnership between Medicare and Medicaid, is the state and the federal agency, and we have had some really good conversations with CMS before we submit our state plan amendments, even before we submit our eleven fifteens. Um, so that they're complete and CMS knows what's coming and they're easily approved. I mean, we had a couple that were were approved in the 30-day time frame. Uh, when we submitted our 1115, there had been so many conversations between Leslie and her team and CMS that it was declared complete when it was submitted. And we're hoping that that means that we'll get uh, something um, uh, approval very soon. But again, the the work that these individuals have put into the med, I cannot um, thank the Medicaid team enough for everything that they've they've done. I think that we have a really good uh, Medicaid um, uh, team right now. We have individuals who have quite a bit of tenure, who who can say, "Oh, we've already tried that, or we need to try this." And and, and it's just you know it's it's a it's a great team right now. And again, very excited for the next four years. Thank you. And I think Peggy has her hand up. Hi, Peggy. Yes, good morning. This is Peggy Roark, a Medicaid recipient. I'm sorry, I'm running late. I had some questions. Um, is the MCOs paying for crowns? Yes, they were enhanced vision, dental, and hearing. Uh, for adults uh, includes coverage of crowns if that individual meets medical necessity and that crown would be the most appropriate uh, um, service for that for the for that individual. I also found out I didn't know that you can download an app 
for the MCOs. Mm -hmm. And I just found that out. And also found out uh, when people's reporting um, their doctor visits, they're not going to take them till March. So if we can have if we can have some of those individuals, we get some specific in, um, examples, or though in, those individuals can reach out to us, we can help them. We or the MCOs, we be in the Department for Medicaid Services or the managed care organization should be able to help them uh, find some services sooner. We we would definitely work on that. Thank you, Commissioner Lee. That's thank you, Peggy. Questions. Thank you, Peggy. Yeah, thank you for bringing those things up. Uh, Peggy, I do think the enhanced vision, hearing, and dental services, those numbers are just astronomical. Mm -hmm. And in a time when so many of our legislators want people to get back to work, uh, you know, we have to assume that people that have glasses and can actually see now uh, or have uh, don't have dental pain or are hearing better can pursue school and work and, and uh, enjoy their lives. So I think you know, from the mental health standpoint, and we've uh, testified on this, the mental health benefits of having those things taken care of are just uh, astronomical, I think. So thank you. Um, let's move on then. We're uh, due for our biannual maternal child up update, and that's typically um, Dr. Terrio. Hello. Hello. Um, How are you? Great. How are you? I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Right. And find it and hope that it works. Can you guys see that? Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, wonderful. Um, well, this won't take much time. I just wanted to give a little bit of an update on um, some of the things that we've been doing with maternal health. Basically, I'll talk about two different things. Um, the first is going to be congenital syphilis or syphilis in general. And um, the second is the lifeline for moms, which I probably some of you have heard about. Um, congenital syphilis, I don't know if you guys are aware, has really skyrocketed in the last 10 years. So this is a national um, from the CDC national data from November of 2023 that showed an uh, increase uh, from 335 patients being born with syphilis to over 3,700, which is huge. 30 years ago in the United States, we thought we were gonna eradicate syphilis completely. Um, when we look at Kentucky, we've actually gone up a little bit more than that. Um, percentage wise, we went from two babies in 2012 to 35 babies in 2022. And I don't have the number for 2023 yet. Um, I'm afraid it's going to be more. But um, but the increase nationwide was over a thousand percent. Ours was 1650 percent, which is crazy. And when you look at it on a net, you know, what states um are having more trouble with this issue, it's the Southeastern states. So Louisiana, I believe is leading the pack um, with a very large number of babies born every year with syphilis. Kentucky is kind of included in that, um, those Southeastern states were the northernmost of, of that group. And we actually have the lowest increase of the group. So it, it's a very big problem. Um, and the the crazy thing is it's it's preventable. Um, that vital signs report from the CDC in November said about ninety percent of newborn syphilis is, could have been prevented with timely testing and treatment. Um, more than half of the the moms who tested positive did not get effective treatment. Now about 40% of those um, had no prenatal care. So they you know, walked into the hospital to deliver, they were tested and they were positive. So they, they did, didn't really have to, they didn't have time for treatment. But um, effective treatment means if you're pregnant and you test positive for syphilis, if you're treated within 30 days, um, 30 days prior to the baby being born, that's effective, that should work. Um, and so, 
60% of the people were tested in an appropriate amount of time, but not treated. And that's, that's a little scary. So I don't know if people aren't looking at the test and you don't know how to interpret the test. It's pretty simple. You don't know how to treat it if it's positive, um, but there seems to be a lack of, of training or an opportunity um, to train and educate um, providers more on what to do if you get a positive test and, and the time frame you have to do it in. Um, so congenital syphilis is syphilis um, um, when the newborn is born. So you've already got infected from your mom. Um, usually infected mothers, and sometimes the infants as well, don't, don't have any symptoms. So you can't tell by looking at the at the patient if they have syphilis or not. So really you have to screen. And be the best screening is done with um, the um, uh, several times during the pregnancy. Uh, you don't screen people you think are gonna be positive. You really need to screen everybody um, to, to have an effective screening tool. And so, the CDC is suggesting that we screen pregnant persons at three different times during the pregnancy. So that's great. If you, if you screen them, you find them positive, you treat them, and the treatment is easy as actually a penicillin shot. It's very easy. Um, if you don't treat, you can have stillbirths. A lot of times if syphilis, congenital syphilis occurs in the first trimester, the baby will um, be born dead, so you'll have a stillbirth. Um, you can have premature births. A lot of um, blindness and deafness occur. Um, developmental delays, which could you know last lifelong um, with intellectual disabilities. And there's other things, problems with your teeth, problems with your bones, different things that can happen if it's if you're not treated. Um, and so, and the and these things are are things we don't see in an adult that that catches syphilis because it's, you know, what happens for the developing fetus in utero and, and the infection that's affecting all of your different body parts. So um, the crazy thing is it is preventable if we just screen for it. Um, we also looked at um, Kentucky Medicaid paid claims uh, and for babies with syphilis, because if it's going to cause all this trouble, what what's the financial impact? And we found that at least in the first year of life, that babies with congenital syphilis have double the amount of paid claims than all the other babies combined. And that those other babies combined include the congenital heart babies. It also includes the um, babies with spinal muscular atrophy, um, which is, if, if you don't know, spinal muscular atrophy is the... Um, the congenital disease that we now um, miracle have a, a treatment for that treatment is a shot that costs $2 million. So that's including those babies um, and congenital syphilis, you know, out, out cost them all. So what have we done? I got together with the other um, Medicaid medical directors in the Southeastern states, and we thought we would put out a health alert um, all on the same day. So we did it on December 15th of last year to kind of alert our states all at the same time. And again, thinking that if all of the Southern states are doing it, then maybe, you know, somebody on the national level would, would notice as well. But um, put out a health alert asking um, docs to screen routinely um, and in anybody of childbearing age, but certainly of pregnant individuals. And if they're pregnant, treat or screen three different times at the beginning of the pregnancy, at the first prenatal visit, between 28 and 32 weeks, and then at delivery. Um, and do this regardless of perceived risk, because if you perceive a risk that's subjective, um, you just have to do it to everybody. And then we've asked that you do not discharge that baby until you know the results of the test. And I know that sounds crazy, but it, 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 if that test is positive, you have to start treating right away so you can help um, prevent some of these long-term consequences and um, every day counts. So don't, don't discharge the baby until you know the results of the test. 
And then of course, report the test to the, to the um, Department of Public Health because they need to do their investigation and try and find out, you know, where, you know, how it's spreading and, and how to stop it. Um, so we put, we partnered with, we in Kentucky Medicaid partnered with the Department of Public Health to help put out this health alert. And, um, and I think that's just a good example of how we are partnering with our sister agencies, um, you know, leaning on each other's strengths to, to try and, and address health effects um, in the state. So do you guys have any questions about congenital syphilis? Uh, I have a I have a question, Dr. Terrio. Okay. Just uh, two things. Uh, do you have any understanding of why the southeast states seem to be seeing the the greatest, uh, you know, uptick? And then the second question, again, uh, speculative. Uh, it seems to me like some additional testing just in the general population is testing expensive and difficult. Is it something that that uh, you know folks who are uh, getting other routine tests, could it be included relatively easily in that? Um, well, for your first question, I think there's a lot of poverty. There's a lot of access to care issues, um, not necessarily in Kentucky. Um, there is poverty, but in the southeastern states, there, there's more difficulty with health insurance. And I, I think that probably plays into why it's worse in the, in the southeast eastern states. Um, for screening, we are looking into, anybody can screen. I mean, I'm a pediatrician and I would routinely screen my patients um, if they had you know, reason to, to be screened if they were sexually active. Um, a lot of doctors will screen for gonorrhea and chlamydia because that's just peeing in a cup and they wouldn't screen for the rest of the sexually transmitted diseases, which require a blood test, basically HIV and, and syphilis, but um, they're all sexually transmitted diseases. and and so I suspect we're not screening for the, you know, the other two as much because it's a blood test than you are um, for chlamydia and gonorrhea. The, um, but we are looking into, we have syringe exchange programs where they routinely will test for HIV with a rapid test. And we're looking into seeing if we can use a rapid test because they do exist for mm -hmm. um, those syringe exchange programs to do HIV as well as syphilis testing. Um, a lot of times the hospitals will will batch testing. And so let's say on Thursday morning, they'll run the syphilis test. Well, that's great, except if you get your blood drawn on Friday, you have to wait a week you know, before you get the results. So maybe utilizing a rapid test, if not for everybody that gets, gets a t tested in the hospital, but certainly on labor and delivery, that will give you a, a answer right away um would would be one one thing we can do so working with public health we're looking into different ways to increase screening that that won't really increase costs but will reach more people i'm really struck by the statistic about the cost involved in treating those children who are adversely affected and i'm you know I, i'm i'm just just slightly old enough to remember when the Wasserman test was required in various places to before you got a marriage license, right, to test for syphilis. And I think, oh, that's why they did it. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> there you go. That's yeah. true. Thank you. Uh, that's very helpful, and it's also, I think, just a good, uh, a good reminder of of why some of those rapid tests and any time. I mean, you know, syphilis is a silent. It, it's silent for so long. It can be dramatically problematic to not yes. catch it it yes very i mean and it's this is obviously dramatic for the the baby if you don't catch it but you know for me if i got syphilis and didn't know it could be i can advance well i could spread it but i can also advance to neurosyphilis which is uh they're not good so it there's so many reasons to screen um that's why preventive health is so important Dr. Terrio, uh, Leon uh, Lamoureux from uh, Anthem put in the chat that they would be happy to have this uh, alert and put it in their, I think he said, monthly newsletter that goes out to all of their providers. So I wonder if uh, the alert was sent, you know, specifically to the MCOs. It was sent out to providers, but I will send it or I'll give it to, to Aaron 
the, um, right. the actual alert right. and she can send it out to the group after the meeting. Yeah, I think that would be very helpful. Thank you, Leon, for that suggestion and offer to spread the word. This sounds like a, a really important one to spread the word and then to get providers to do the screening, basically, and do it with everyone. That yes. Yeah. That. Not repetition. just people that kind of, yes. Yeah, repetition builds conviction, right? So if we can just uh, hit them many, many times with the message, I think it will all be, we'll all be better off. That's true. That's true. And, and, um, you know, nine months is a long time, you know, I, you know, so it's really important to test more than once during the pregnancy, anything could happen, um, during that time. Right. right. But Thanks. I do remember when we started testing for HIV during pregnancy, it was sort of the same thing. It, it went, once people started testing, they would test, you know, at the first prenatal visit and then it would be negative. And then they'd say, okay, I don't have to worry about that. And it's like, well, now we test multiple times um, because yes, you do have to worry about it. And this is exactly the same thing. All right, well, moving on to something more exciting, well, not exciting, but more um, upbeat. Um, I wanted to talk about Lifeline for Moms. This is a service that started in Massachusetts. And it is a perinatal mental health care support and counseling service. And it's a little bit of a misnomer because it's really a lifeline for providers. Um, it's what it is, is a perinatal mental health um, for, for the frontline providers, like the OBGYNs, the family medicine, the pediatricians that are seeing moms um, during this time. Um, of their lives. So perinatal mental health is from during the pregnancy up through 12 months postpartum. And it really includes um, mental and behavioral health. And so why is it important? Well, we know that one in eight women will experience postpartum depression and that's not just, oh, baby blues or, oh, I'm sleep deprived, it's postpartum depression. If you add in other um, mental health issues as well as substance use, you get up to one in five women, which is you know twenty percent of, of of individuals in this this category. Um, maternal suicide causes twenty percent of postpartum deaths among women with depression, and we do know that mental and and sub mental health and substance use. Um, are a leading cause of preventable causes of maternal death. We see that in our own um, Kentucky data and we've presented to you guys on that. And the scary thing is 75% of women who screen positive, so these are women you have screened, it's positive for depression, They 75% don't receive any treatment. And um, and that's a little crazy for me, almost as crazy as you know not treating somebody for syphilis. Um, because you, if you don't know how to treat, you just look it up and you know. But um, these are women that have screened positive, probably in their provider's office. Um, it's documented and they're not treated. And we've actually done studies on this and we've seen that, you know, ask providers, why, why don't you treat? And, and, they, and a lot of providers say, well, I don't wanna screen because I don't know what to do. I don't know how to treat it. I don't have the resources to treat it. Um, and so I, I don't, I don't treat it, um, which is really sad and scary. Um, the other thing provider said, I just don't want, I, I, you know, I, if I wanted to be a psychiatrist, I wanted, I would have gone into psychiatry. I don't, I, you know, I became a pediatrician or I became an OB and I don't want to deal with that mental health stuff. And, and I know you behavioral health folks on the call understand because people have probably told me that, um, it's scary because, you know, what if, you know, what if I was walking down the street and I saw somebody lying in the gutter and they have a gunshot wound and they're bleeding and I say, well, I'm not a trauma surgeon. I can't treat you. Um, and then you just walk on by. You know, it's sort of the same thing. If, if you have a, a patient with a, an issue that needs treatment, I think you're morally obligated to treat. Um, so that's what Lifeline for, for Moms will do. Oh, the other thing, we've talked about disparities for um, in, in maternal health. And I, although Black women are um, 
more likely to have an illness related to their, their maternal mortality um, than white women. When you look at um, perinatal mental health, despite the higher rates of illness, black women are actually less likely than white women to get um, uh, mental health care. So Lifeline for Moms or, or AKA Lifeline for Providers is really gonna help um, give the providers a tool to use to treat women and um, feel confident um, in, in helping women with this issue. And so the Department of Public Health, again, we're working with with Department of Public Health on this. They've received a five-year grant um, that's $750,000 per year. Um, they've just gotten it. So this is the first year. They're going to be hiring a full-time staff, which is going to be a social worker. They're going to have hire two pro healthcare professionals, usually a psychiatrist. They want a psychiatrist and probably a psychologist. And they're going to start some academic detailing first with OBGYNs and then expanding to other people that, that see moms during the perinatal time period, so pediatricians and family medicine. Um, we're gonna use our Medicaid data um, to see where the highest um, use of the emergency room is for postpartum women and, um, and where the higher levels of maternal mortality and mental health issues are, are a diagnosis. And we're gonna start in those areas of the state first. And providers, if you screen somebody that's positive, and they're sitting in their office and you don't know what to do, providers will be able to call a 1-800 number, talk to the administrative staff who will contact the, the behavioral health person on call, who will return your call immediately while the patient's in your office. You can chat with that person, exchange the clinical information, and at the end of that call, the provider will have a treatment plan um, and be able to direct the, the patient's care. So it you know could be, okay, they need to go see this doctor, here's the appointment. You know We can get you appointment in three days. Or it could be start this medicine and follow up you know in, in three weeks. Or it could be go straight to the emergency department you know because she's suicidal. So it could be anything, but the provider will have that backup. He will be able to talk to the, the expert, come up with a treatment plan and help the, the patient right away. It will start um, eight to five and hopefully expand to 24 seven in Massachusetts, it's 24 um, seven. And, and obviously plans are to expand through the rest of the state. So um, this, is, this has just started Lifeline for Moms, really Lifeline for, for providers. I, I think this is gonna be a game changer. Um, I mean, cause I've been in the situation where I, I'm talking to the mom. I don't know what to do. Um, and honestly, in our clinic, we now have clinical social workers. We have a list of, of docs we can call for um, um, postpartum depression and get them in right, who understand the need of getting the patient in right away. Um, and we develop these resources on our own because out of need. Um, and now, Hopefully, this will increase the number of healthcare providers over time that can go ahead and address um, the needs of these perinatal women because they're going to learn. The more phone calls they make to the to the hotline, they're going to learn what to do, and then they'll have more tools in their toolbox to to address the needs of the the patient. So um, yes, it's going to help providers. It's certainly going to help um, pregnant and postpartum individuals. And um, ultimately, it may lead to more integration of mental health and physical health into the same care settings, which you know is what we ultimately need. So um, do you guys have any questions about Lifeline for Moms? Uh, Dr. Terrio, uh, Sheila Schuster here. I'm, I'm curious about, is this a grant to Medicaid or a grant to public health? Who actually got the grant? Public health. Dr. White. Okay. All right, Public Dr. White, good. Because uh, there's been a lot of movement legislatively. You remember that we passed Senate Bill 135 in the 2023 session, and it was directed at the perinatal mood and anxiety disorders, which includes, of course, postpartum depression, but also all the others. And I know that Dr. White has pulled together that group of stakeholders and that they're meeting. And one of the things that's included in that 
is representation from some of the Kentucky universities because we really have a shortage. There are very few psychologists, uh, mm -hmm. psychiatrists, social workers who actually have the training uh, specifically in perinatal mood and anxiety disorders. Um, I also, uh, are you all in communication with Representative Moser? Because she has House Bill uh, 10, mm -hmm. and it's a bipartisan bill. Uh, that's called, she's calling the Momnibus Bill, and it starts out actually with putting a psychi psychiatrist and a psychologist. Sounds very much like this. I'm a little bit confused about mm -hmm. what the overlap might be or duplication. Well, um, Dr. White was working with her to um, put this into legislation. Um, and, okay. and so it is the same thing, but the thought is the HRSA grant is for five years and it's only um, $750,000. And eventually, if it's going to you know, expand to the, the whole state and be 24 seven, it's gonna need a lot more money and it's probably gonna need more support from the state. And so right. I think Dr. White was thinking this is a first step, but you're right. It's the same thing. Okay. It's, I thought it sounded very familiar and I was like, <laughs> and, and it's actually um, an extension then of what we started with Senate Bill 135. Yes. yes with Dr. White. Okay. All right. That's this, great. And it just shows that how we are working with other, you know, sister agencies to, to address different needs. Yeah. The, moving forward for maternal health. Well, I think it's very exciting. And certainly the uh, when you look at the stats on uh, suicide, particularly, and uh, you've uh, also presented in a previous presentation to the MAC, the disparity numbers uh, between white moms mm -hmm. and moms of color. Yep. And we, we see that in mental health for sure. So any other questions for Dr. Terrio? This is the... Uh... Garth Bobrowski, I had a quick question. I just, if, and I think it was on your slide 13, but uh, if you help me understand, um, you know, and Dr. Schuster, you just made a comment about the disparities, you know, between groups of folks. Uh, and I was just kind of wondering why the, you know, black women were having, you know, three or four times more problems that I, I can't remember the exact slide, um, but you know, uh, and it just looks like, well, it is access to care the problem or, I mean, in, in this day and time, I mean, a lot of times transportation is provided, uh, you know, there's there's MDs, there's, uh, uh, you know, healthcare clinics, uh, there's pastors, counselors, uh, you know, community healthcare workers, I just wondered what what do you all see uh, in your area as the reason they have this disparity? It it is actually um, amazing when you look at maternal deaths, and this is nationwide as well as Kentucky. Um, um, the most common reason for maternal <clears throat> death for white women have to do with um, mental health and substance use. The most common reason for death for a black woman is an like a hypertension and like postpartum hypertension or cardiovascular issues. So it's like a medical type issue. But then when you ferret it out, um, black women are are less likely to be treated for depression than than white women. So it. So it's still bad, but it, it is amazing that when you look at the, the deaths by black and white, the, the black women are dying from medical causes more than, than white. Um, and so when you want to address um, maternal mortality, you need to you know address both. If you just go headlong into substance use, you're only really going to be affecting white women and you're still going to have a disparity. Um, but, you know, most black women in Kentucky, they live in, um, urban areas. They have access to transportation. They have access to tertiary medical centers with all the experts, you know, and, and, and the high risk OBs and all that. And yet they still are dying at, at a higher rate than white women of illness. So it's multifactorial. Um, I think implicit bias has to do a lot with that. Um, you know, because it's the same doctors and same staff and 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 same hospitals. Um, but the white 
women are getting treated differently than the black women. Um, so there's a lot to look into and I, I don't really have a good answer for you. I just know what we see. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Terrio. Um, any other, uh, Ramona Johnson just suggested that um, psychiatric nurse practitioners would also be, should also be included as providers mm -hmm. in this. And I think that's true as well. Um, any other questions then? Well, we thank you very much and we'll see you in six months because I think we have you on a six month schedule. So thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Terry. I appreciate it. Um, next up is our quarterly update on um, PDS, person directed services rate increases. And I think uh, Eric Wright uh, wanted us to put this on on a regular basis. That may be Pam Smith who's going to address this. Yes, that, that would be Pam. Yes, so <clears throat> there really hasn't been any any changes. I mean, the um, the uh, rates for PDS, those base rates went up at the same time that the other rate increases um, went in. And uh, we've been instructing the, um, you know, anytime we've had any issues from anyone uh, receiving um, having a modification done to update that rate, um, we've addressed those with those particular providers. So I think it's, I, I'm not aware of, of anything that um, is any different or any other issues that we're having outside of the ones that we are addressing. And PDS is participant directed services. So it's in the waiver programs where the individuals are able to, um, they actually act as the employer and they are able to hire their own um, care staff. Yes. Um, so there was a good bit of funding in the budget bill, House Bill 6, for increased reimbursement um, for providers in the 1915C waivers, Pam. Does that include the PDS? Is that funding? I, I think that the, you know, the yeah, the, well, the, the budget bills they are still... Yeah. Um, they are uh, preliminary right now, haven't been finalized. And I think that um, after um, session and when we see that finalized budget, we'll be able to talk more and, and answer some of those questions. Yeah. Okay, you wanna see what the final budget is before you- Yeah, yeah, wait before on that. That makes yeah. sense. Yeah. Because we know that there's a long road ahead for the budget bill. Yeah. It hasn't even gotten out of the house yet, so. Yeah. Any other questions? Eric, do you have any questions for um, Pam? I think maybe Eric had to step away for a minute. He had a student come in who needed something. I'll let him follow up directly with you, Pam, if he has any other questions. Okay, that sounds good. All right, thank you. Um, and then our uh, regular report on the unwinding. The unwinding continues to go on. Uh, with flexibilities and uh, so forth. So who's going to do that for us, Commissioner? I, I can do that. Um, okay. Veronica was really busy today. She do, and she does a really good job and she's on top of all this. I do have a presentation, but I think in the interest of time, um, I'll just kind of, uh, you know, go, rather than going through the numbers and everything, I can tell you one big uh, piece of news is that our eligibility flexibilities uh, you know, we were our, we're moving through unwinding and we will uh, be would have been done with unwinding at the end of May. And we have so many flexibilities that have helped individuals stay in. But CMS has, ex has extended those flexibilities, will allow us to extend those flexibilities without taking actions until December the 31st of 2024. So that is really good news uh, for all of our eligibility flexibilities that will be extended. Uh, we're currently our en enrollment is is one uh, one point five million um, actually one million five hundred sixty thousand uh, individuals right now. If you remember at the height of um, COVID, we were about one point seven. Prior to um, COVID, we were one point three million. So we're still up uh, around two hundred thousand individuals in our enrollment. 
with our uh, terminations, you know, we started again in May with our terminations. We saw 34,124 terminations in that month. Uh, December of 2023, we only saw 1,244. Again, those individuals uh, that we um, we prioritized up front, we knew that many of those may uh, not meet Medicaid eligibility. So we wanted to focus, um, you know, on on all of those individuals who who may remain in the program. But we're starting to see our numbers, our terminations really decrease. In October, for example, we had 12,613 terminations. Again, in December, 1,244. We have some demographic information um, on our December uh, uh, disenrollments, and that is in this PowerPoint. Again, I will give this to uh, to Erin, and she will be able to send it out to uh, the MAC members. Um, as of uh, December, um, individuals who had were procedurally terminated, you know, they have 90 days to respond and come back into the program. If they're determined eligible, they're reinstated. In December, we had 391 uh, reinstatements. And again, you know, we just ask that everyone keep uh, help us get the message out about you know the uh, unwinding and, and how important it is for individuals to um, to respond to information. Uh, related to our qualified health plan enrollment window, it closed January 16th of 2024. However, we will have a special enrollment period uh, uh, after January 16, uh, 2024 with a qualifying event. And we will have an unwinding special enrollment from March 31st, 2023 through December 31st of 2024. So um, in addition, if a Kentucky met, uh, resident loses their Medicaid coverage at any time, you know, they can, they may be eligible to enroll in a qualified health plan with financial assistance. Our qualified health plan open enrollment ended uh, with uh, 75,820 enrollees. That was a significant uh, increase from our 2020 um from our previous uh, uh, enrollment in 2023. And again, you can just stay informed on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram uh, with all of our unwinding activities. Uh, we um, will have a, a, a on, ongoing stakeholder meetings the third Thursday at a, of each month at 11, and we will send out links to those. So I will share this presentation that has a little bit more information with Erin, and she can send that out to the Mac, but I would be more than happy to answer any questions you may have. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. That uh, presentation is always very helpful to actually see the numbers, and I think you've beefed up the demographics, as I recall, from the yes. presentation that uh, Veronica did at the VH TAC. Any other, any questions from any of the uh, TAC members about unwinding? Uh, I do think it is all of our responsibility, whatever role we have here on the MAC and with the tax, whether you're a provider or you represent Medicaid beneficiaries, the basic message is answer the questions, you know, respond to your, to your mail or to the call or to the text that you're getting. I know the DMS is reaching out in every way possible. The MCOs are also reaching out but it's a lot easier to keep people enrolled than to let them fall off the wagon and then have to get them back on, although they can re-enroll, I think, for those 90 days without any difficulty. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. And, and as far as children, you know, our um, children, we have continuous eligibility, but if a child um, has, if it's time for their recertification, uh, we were supposed to we well we we do that recertification to make sure they still meet and then for for a year, but we received we're one of the only states right now. Uh, several states have reached out to us and asked for our information. We did receive approval from CMS to keep those children enrolled uh, that, without doing that recertification. Uh, we got approval to extend um, all children up to twelve months uh, during this public health unwinding emergency again one of the only states that has done that, and we are helping other states to keep their children enrolled um, through that method. That's fantastic news, uh, Commissioner Lee, because we know that the, it starts with the kids and we've got to get them healthy. Um, any questions on unwinding? We've heard about unwinding. We all feel a little unwound, I think, but um, I appreciate that. 
Um, if not, then the last update that we had asked for was on mobile crisis. And that's probably Leslie. That would be me. So <laughs> as you're aware, I can actually give you some information today. And this is going to be exciting because we can continue to work towards uh, more and more information, Dr. Schuster. And then um, also I was going to talk to you about maybe um, having our contractor to sit in on one of the meetings so folks can see the face of the Kentucky representative. Um, and he's actually moving here to Kentucky. So that's a really good thing. Um, just to give you a little bit of background, you know, over gosh, three years we've been working on mobile as well. And we started out, uh, not quite three years, but working on an, a grant that allowed us to take a year to partner with our sister agencies and work on an implementation for an all-inclusive one continuum uh, for mobile crisis here in Kentucky. We did have a lot of programs going on here in Kentucky. A lot of them were small or limited, um, and uh, some might have been limited in funds. And so what we were trying to do is figure out how to leverage the, the wonderful work that we have here in Kentucky and leverage that into a system that we could create together. So um, we did a, if you remember, we did a 258 page needs assessment. That wasn't what Medicaid uh, felt like the state needed. That was boots on the ground, hearing from folks, hearing from providers, advocacy groups, CMHC, CCBHCs, uh, all those acronyms of all the different providers and hearing uh, EMS, uh, emergency um, uh, transport folks and uh, crisis and first responders like police officers, law enforcement and things like that. So we developed that and from that needs assessment drove every decision that we've made going forward based on what we heard that that Kentucky needed. So in July of 2023, CMS approved um, the Kentucky Department for Medicaid Services state plan to cover a, a community-based mobile crisis intervention service, which we call uh, MCIS. I know there's a lot of acronyms again. And uh, DMS has actually just contracted, and I can say this because we uh, announced it uh, in a meeting on the 18th that Carolyn was awarded as the oversight administrator for lack of better words, provider capacity, training, and data gatherer of this multifaceted system. It's a huge program with lots of moving parts. Um, again, it had to be complex to meet Kentucky's needs. Um, so we have developed and gotten approved by CMS as well. Things like new service definitions that meet not only that that state letter that CMS asked for, all those requirements, like a two-person team, 24-7, and all those things in order for the uh, CMS to give, um, uh, make a match rate or give us part of that, those funds to produce. But we also realized during that needs assessment that although we wanted to minimize law enforcement, that in rural Kentucky, we were going to need to have another plan. So if you remember, we've also developed a community CCCR model. Model, which is a community crisis co-response model. And that's where we know that in rural Kentucky, where 112 of the 120 counties is deemed rural, that we're going to need to build uh, more available teams out in Kentucky. So we gave out grants uh, from CHFS with Medicaid uh, looking over the administration of that. Uh, we gave out grants to municipalities who wanted to build a team that would have a licensed person available. Or maybe some of these um, were folks who had limited grants that needed to be able to expand maybe 24-7 nights and weekends. I've gotten lots of calls that just say simply, I need a licensed professional on my team. How can I cover this? And we've been working through that. So we did our first round and I can tell you who those awardees were. They were the Lexington Fayette Urban uh, County Government, the Warren County Sheriff's Office, the Perry County Ambulance Authority, the Cynthia Police Department, Maysville Police Department, Christian County Fiscal Court and Bull County Fiscal Court. And I don't know if you had an opportunity to watch when the governor announced this, we actually had them to make videos. And it was um, when we awarded those six, the, the videos are humbling in themselves. But when we awarded those 
grants, it was so humbling to see a group of folks who just wanted to make their community better and wanted to help those in need. There was, it was just a wonderful experience personally for me to be able to hear those folks, uh, for example, in Boyle County saying, here we are in Bull County. We want to expand our services. We love our community and we just want to figure out how to help folks. It was so empowering just to hear uh, them talking about that. We will uh, be giving out another round in fall. I don't have an exact date, but we will be giving out another uh, round. I have told the folks that have been awarded, please do not feel like competition. We want to expand this thought process across Kentucky. So we want to build that. Um, the This administration has given us the ability to um, enhance and provide services that we've wanted to for many, many years and just didn't quite know how to get there. So um, it's so exciting to see this opportunity to come about. I do want to mention that last uh, January the 3rd, there was a provider letter. I think it only uh, maybe got out to providers, to all providers last week. Um, you may have seen that. And it's just describing what I've told you that CMS approved our services. We've added other services. We have mobile crisis intervention services, 23-hour crisis op observation, and lots of acronyms to go along with that. I'm sorry. And then we have a behavioral health crisis transport. We were also involved with what Commissioner Lee mentioned earlier about helping the, uh, with EMS, the treat not transport, uh, and as well as uh, um, uh, being able to transport and get paid from other locations than a hospital. So we've been working on those things as well. Um, the long and short of things that people usually ask me, and there is a letter out there, is, you know, how does this all work? So we for, for one thing, we wanted to ensure, and I can give the story that I've given many, many times about the warm handoff that, you know, SAMHSA pretty much has a guideline about how we want this to occur. And it's someone to call, a warm handoff, someone to respond, and a place to go. So that's based on that needs assessment, we realized we didn't have a lot of places to go. So that's why we've been developing like the 23-hour crisis observation and uh, being able to have a transport that's not necessarily law enforcement involved. So um, we, the one main thing that we want to make sure that we can do is that we want to serve all anyone, anywhere, anytime. Um, I also have been asked about waiver clients. We can cover waiver clients. Uh, we can cover the they uninsured and the underinsured. So Dr. Schuster, if your insurance doesn't cover uh, a crisis and you have a crisis, we can cover you. Same for me, same for anybody in my family, Any anybody that's on this call today. Um, it's very exciting. Our, our big hope is to divert from emergency rooms, psychiatric hospitals, and definitely incarceration and making sure that two things, appropriate level of care and our appropriate response. You all have heard me that... Um, I don't, I don't want the response to a 21-year-old with anxiety and depression to be the same response that we would give to an elderly person who's having a crisis with dementia, right? So we want to ensure that there's training and access and oversight, technical assistance for those specifics. And I have a whole list of, um, of areas that we want additional training, uh, LGBT Q community, um, all those different brain injury. Um, so it's very, very exciting. And I can continue to tell you all more uh, as it rolls out, but that's currently where we are. We did have to change uh, where we were with our contractor care lawn when they first came on because the grants uh, were already out there uh, and we were trying to ensure that they're going to get paid uh, timely for their grant uh, awards. So that'll be the, one of the first things, uh, pass through dollars to pay for those um, seven uh, grant awardees that I told you about. They are currently working with DMS and our sister agency, D, uh, DBH, um, to contact all providers. We will be starting with the Safety Net CMHC providers and the CCBHC providers first. Um, and they will be starting next week with a uh, collective group. And then we're going to meet with them individually after that. So uh, very exciting. Lots more to come. Um, do you have any questions for me, Dr. Schuster? I wonder if you could send uh, Aaron a copy of that provider letter. Yes. To be distributed. That sounds like a great overview of yes. the services. I think that would be very, very yes. helpful to see. And I think the question that has come up, and we've talked about the 988 uh, crisis um, and suicide prevention line that's nationally, it's been around since mid-July of 
2022. Um, so how does that interface with all of this? How do those call centers interface so, with this. Exactly. So uh, from the call center, we, we wanted to leverage the good work that we have here in Kentucky already. So we have embedded our existing 988 and partnered with DBH uh, and the CMHCs that provide that 988 crisis call center. So calls can come from 988 or 911 and depending on that avenue is where that call would go. Um, but the main, the most important thing is that warm handoff. Um, and if they need deployment, then the ASO will take over as the deployer uh, based on the 988 call and triage. So we are leveraging everything that DBH, all the good work that they've done as our beginning phase to this. So um, I think one of the most important things, and especially when we were out there listening to folks, is um Instead of saying, hang on the line or just a minute or we'll be right with you or something like that, a person's going to come and say, you know, Leslie, I hear your crisis. I've got you. Um, we're going to get somebody out to you and don't drop the phone line. We are going to connect them through um, our air traffic controller technology um, with our ASO and that person will come online and then. This person will say, I have Susie online for you, Leslie, and now Susie, Susie's going to take over and they're on their way to you. So that, sorry. That's, I'm sorry. That's been the most important thing for us is that warm handoff and then a place to go so that they are diverted from any, from any inappropriate care. I'm sorry, my dog's work. Does your dog want to be a part of the Mac? Y yes. Um, Actually, he's, he's got the vacuum cleaner, I think. <laughs> um, okay, that's very helpful. Um, any questions from any of the MAC members about the mobile crisis? I think it'll be helpful for us to see that letter and see the articulation of the various services and so forth. And Aaron, and if you're on, can you just ensure that everybody gets that if they haven't already? You may have already sent it out to at least the tax. Okay. <clears throat> I'm sorry, I'm caught me drink, taking a drink of water. I just oh, sent out the um, EMS treat no transport provider letter. Is that what you're talking about? No. Oh, this my one is actually the mobile crisis intervention MCIS expansion. So if you don't have that, I'll make sure that you get it and get to the to the Mac and tax. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. That would be great, Leslie. Thank you, uh, Aaron. Uh, any questions for Leslie? Okay, so we are finished. Thank you very much, uh, Leslie, and thank you, Commissioner Lee. And we are ready to move on to our TAC reports. And I would like to point out that we. Uh, sorry, Sheila. I'm sorry, I just Gary. To ask, yeah. Uh, is there a po is there a poster uh, for the crisis center uh, that we, the doctors' offices could put up? Is that I mean that, that sounds like a beautiful you know program. Um, I have a poster that we just developed recently, like a big one in my office through communications, but online you're, you'll be able, I know you probably can't see, we have a diagram that explains that 988 warm handoff um, and then going through the process all the way through post-crisis services. So um, that is on the website and I'll ensure that Aaron gets that and sends it out as well. But um, it's, um, it's kind of powerful in the way that it shows that we're trying to close every loop that we can. Um, and also um, not just not just mobile itself, but it it's it's the whole sequential intercept for Kentucky. We want to ensure that even with mobile, you know, even as the starting point, that we continue all through our processes uh, to decriminalize and to ensure that we've got diversion all along the way. So um, I'm working on a draft of picture for that one too. So I will ensure that you get this draft though, okay? Thank you. Yeah, a great question, Jerry. And, and uh, that reminds me that uh, uh, Keith put in the chat from EM, the EMS tech uh, that the provider letter was very, informative and very helpful. Uh, I think I would ask the tax, if if your TAC would deal in any way with crisis situations, if you might include this on your agenda for your next couple of meetings so that you can uh, we can get a feel here at the MAC about what you're seeing on the ground. It would give us a great uh, source of feedback. And I would think, Leslie, it would be helpful to you all 
to get that feedback and the tax may be a great way to do that. So, and I'll send out an email to you all just to remind you, because I know a couple of people had to get off. So thank you very much. Um, so for our TAC reports, we're gonna start at the uh, back end of the alphabet. We'll start with the uh, therapy services. And I think that's Dale Lynn. It is, thank you, Sheila. Um, yeah. We actually don't have anything to report. Uh, at this time. Did you all have a meeting since uh, we last? We did have a meeting. Um, okay. And no recommendations and, and yeah. no report. Correct. There was okay. no uh, recommendations for the MAC. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, primary care, I know, had to leave because they're having a, an event with their legislators over in the annex, and they've moved to a uh, quarterly meeting schedule. So they have not had a meeting, but they will have a meeting in February. We'll have a report for us in March. Um, physician services, uh, Dr. Thornberry. Reporting for that. We do not. Ashima, are you saying something? Yes, can you hear me? Not very well. Speak up. We did not meet. You did not meet. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, pharmacy. Uh, Ron Poole. Okay. Ron is not here today. I apologize. Okay. He can be here. So I'm going to report for him on his behalf. Uh, they did meet on 12-13 and they did have a quorum. Um, they did not have any recommendations for, you know, or anything of note for from the meeting, but there were a few things that they wanted me to bring to the max attention. They did discuss the um, community health worker regulation and reinforced, you know, that many of these functions that are being done um, within that sector are already being done or could be done in a pharmacy and be offered to patients. And since, you know, pharmacists and their staff are the most successful providers in the community, as such, this could make a positive impact. So there's some discussion around that. Um, at this time, you know, pharmacists and pharmacy staff and pharmacies are not included um, as approved providers for community health worker services within Medicaid. Um, but the acting director of healthcare policy for DMS did explain that this was a new program and everyone understood that has been in the works for a long time, um, two years, and it takes time to work these things out and they need to do some more research. So that was positive. Um, they did say that they would continue to work with the pharmacy stakeholders involved in this process and continue to reach out. So that was good to know and they wanted to thank everyone for that. But they did have some questions remaining. They kind of wanted to bring up, you know, and I think they'll bring up this in the next meeting, um, did they mean that pharmacy would play a supervisory role eventually and be able to order and manage um, job duties of community health workers? Um, you know, what does the department see as that role basically in the end? Um, but again, they wanted to thank uh, the department for continued conversations in this area. Um, other things of note, the um, PTAC has had two meetings organizing the statewide, um, you know, HPV protocol rollout with Dr. Theriot. These are progressing well, which is great. Um, and they wanted to make sure that pharmacists out there knew about the vax immunization counseling. There's been a little slow uptake in that, I believe, because confusion on how to bill for that through the MCOs. And wanted to make sure everybody knew to get the word out through um the state association to make sure staffs could work through these issues with the MCO representatives, because these are very important to get done. But all in, at the end, to wrap it up, they wanted to thank, and so did I, I wanted to thank the Department for Medicaid Services for working with um, the pharmacy stakeholders on this and other issues. Um, these are very important. And I think that, you know, and they did too, that we've had some positive things happen for our patients in all areas. So thank you. Great report, Kathy. Thank you very much. That's the kind of detail I think that's helpful for the MAC members to hear. It gives you a much better feel for what the issues are that you're looking at. Uh, I see my friend Steve Shannon is on to report from the persons returning to society from incarceration. All right, this is Steve Shannon and 
I'll report on it on behalf of, we call it the reentry tax because it's a little bit easier. Um, one, you know, we're all eagerly anticipating the implementation of the waiver that, that, that Leslie Hoffman discussed. We think it's a great opportunity. I think it's going to really change people's lives. And ideally, the goal is to get people connected ASAP to service and supports in the com community. And we're excited about that. And, and we've been partnering with Leslie on this for about 18 months now and looking forward to it. Um, a significant event. We, one, we had no recommendations. We did not have a quorum. Uh, but, we, but we did have a great discussion led by two pharmacists at the University of Kentucky about hepatitis C in correctional facilities. Uh, this was really came out of a previous meeting, and then we followed up afterwards and it had a more detailed conversation, and they presented data. Um, and, and it really is, I think, was a great opportunity, great education for me personally. Uh, 50, 60 percent of folks in facilities, correctional facilities, test positive for hepatitis C. It is treatable. Uh, it takes about 84 days for the treatment regimen to go through, uh, but it, that can be accomplished. Uh, you know, we had some discussions and, and Leslie was there and, and Angela Sparrow did a great job uh, at the meeting as well. Uh, you know, does it make sense to start that treatment 90 days before they leave versus 60? And I think it's it's still open. It, it was on a no. Obviously, the um, CMS guidance is sixty days pre-release, so it's more challenging. Uh, the concern is, do we lose track of people uh, once they are re released and that regimen doesn't finish? Uh, UK data is this can save billions of dollars, uh, you know, long term. Uh, they've had some conversations themselves with CMS. They asked for their contact information to be sent to Medicaid. I think there'll be more conversations. But I really think this was a, a really great dialogue about what can be done to address a public health uh, emergency that, that we're not really tracking. Kentucky's number one in the country, I think, that data says, in hepatitis C cases. And this is a, a great place to look at it. It's also a really great benefit to correctional officers. Uh, and initially, they were talking adult facilities, you know, Department of Corrections, but clearly Leslie Hoppe and Angela Sparrow said, you know, juvenile detention centers are included as well. Let's figure out how to move forward and address that. So that was really a great dialogue we had, and we're looking forward to further partnerships to move that forward if we can. And for sure, that's part of the 60-day pre-release plan as well. So you know, we had no recommendations again. Thank you, Steve. And again, really, really helpful and a, a nice reinforcement from Leslie's presentation <clears throat> to hear about the concerns around hep C. So if you think about both the financial health and the physical health of uh, Medicaid and, and Kentuckians and so forth, if we could get a handle on that while people are in incarceration, it sounds like to get those 84 days of treatment in, uh, that would be great. So, so glad yeah, you yeah. had that presentation and had the, uh, relevant uh, DMS people there too. Thank you. Um, optometric care, um, Matthew Burchett. Uh, I'm Steve Compton from the Optometric. Oh, Steve, okay, sure. Uh, we have not met since the last MAC meeting. We meet again in February and we'll probably have a report and some recommendations for the MAC at that time. All right, thank you very much, Steve. All right. um, there was a, a message from uh, Lisa Lockhart, the nursing services, that she could not be here. And I can't remember now, Leslie, whether she said they had met or not met. They, excuse me, they did meet, um, Sheila, and their next meeting, I believe, is at the beginning of February. Okay. And they uh, also moved to quarterly meetings as well. All right. Thank you. So they didn't have any recommendations or report from the meeting they did have? No, ma'am. Okay, thank you. Uh, nursing homes. Greetings, it's John Muller. We, uh, our hi, TAC John. did, hi there, our TAC did not meet, so nothing to report this time. Okay, thank, thank you. you very much. I see my friend Rick Crispin is on, all ready to report on the IDD or Intellectual and Developmental Disabilities TAC, Rick. Yes, Dr. Schuster, thank you. Uh, yes, we met on the 5th of December. Uh, we had a quorum among the items we discussed. Um, we're still working with Pam Smith to gather information about what happens to 
people who are being served and their providers have concluded that they don't have the resources to properly serve those individuals. Uh, so we're looking again at what happens to that, how long does it take for them to find uh, an alternative provider on waiver redesign. Um, you've heard uh, this, our population really works with two waivers, the um, SCL, which has a residential component and Michelle P, which is more in-home support. You know, they have some services that are in common. However, the definitions differ and the rates differ. And hopefully out of this waiver design, we'll have a lot more consistency, uh, which will be great for providers because it is kind of complicated. Uh, wait lists, uh, Michelle P has about 6,000, I recall, two thirds of those are children. Uh, I think I mentioned last time uh, we are, there is a feasibility study for a children's waiver. Uh, being considered right now for children with uh, developmental disabilities and behavioral health issues. Of the 3,370 people on the SCL waiting list, again, that's the residential component, 79 are in urgent state status and zero on emergency. And that's basically been the case for a long, long time. I think the department's doing a really good job of making sure that people whose living situations have collapsed, that they do get um, those SCL services. Uh, we mentioned uh, HB6 already, uh, might contain, as I think, like nearly a billion dollars for all waiver services increase. That includes uh, slots uh, for residential and 250 for residential, uh, 1,000 for Michelle P. Um, also money perhaps to uh, fulfill some of the items that, that are contained in the rate study to enhance rates even more. Um, I just want to say uh, I really enjoy working with both Pam and Aaron. Uh, Pam does a great job of dealing with a very complicated issue here with these two waivers. Um, and uh, I attend these uh, conferences and uh, I'm really glad I'm from Kentucky because we are really doing a pretty darn good job compared to other states. And we had no recommendations and that's my report. Thank you. That's an excellent report, Chris. Uh, I mean, I'm sorry, Rick. Um, you know, there was money put in the second year of the biennium in the budget bill um, to do further study on that children's waiver. I, I don't know if you saw that or not, but many of us have been involved in the uh, study group for that. Um, yes. it, does, it does raise some questions that I sent actually to Leslie and, and Pam about because people are already wondering, you know, we have so many kids that are on the waiting list, as you mentioned, for Michelle P. And if this new waiver, if and when, and we're probably talking two or three years down the road, then we're going to have to really have a program for deciding uh, who gets those slots and are they the, the kids that have been on waiting list for, say, Michelle P. for umpteen years or not. I think it's going to raise... Uh, I don't want it to be a source of anxiety for parents, but I'm already getting those questions and you may be getting them as well. Yeah, I think that's going to be a tricky process. I think it's, uh, I, I think it may, but over time, over time, we'll see many fewer people on that Medicaid, I mean, the Michelle P waiting list who are children and hopefully then they'll be on this alternative waiver. So it will get better, but I suspect it will take some time because it needs to be done carefully. Yeah, absolutely. All right, thank you very much. Um, Russ, I saw you were on uh, hospital care, please. Yes, ma'am, the, uh, the hospital attack met December 5th. We had a quorum. Uh, we had a presentation on Medicaid open enrollment and Medicaid redeterminations. We talked about and set a, uh, a work group to discuss uh, the sepsis three uh, change that is scheduled for January of 2025. We've had one meeting since then, and we've got our questions and issues um, logged to work through. And uh, we asked to have a presentation on the 2022 quality HRIP quality results. Uh, we had no recommendations, and our next meeting will be on February 27th of this year. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, home health care. I don't think I see Evan is on. Yep. Thanks, Dr. Schuster. <clears throat> the home health tax met um, 
December 19th. And we did not have any recommendations, but we discussed EVV, um, electronic visit verification, which launched uh, January 1st, the updates to the DME fee schedule and the KOG site uh, delays and authorizations. And we continue to monitor the electronic visit verification program to make sure it doesn't have any impact on access or provider ability to serve patients. So more to come on that. Okay, I'm glad you all are looking at that because I hear a lot about EVV and uh, its glitches and it's, you know, sometimes it's working and sometimes not. So appreciate your keeping an eye on that. We would welcome a more discussion about that if you have some sure. as you go along. Sure, it's a big change. Absolutely, yeah. we'd be happy to yeah. provide more information. Yeah, I, do, I think that's something that we may need to have a, a more general discussion about. Thank you. Um, health disparities, uh, Dr. Burke. Uh, yeah, we met on January 17th. Uh, we did not have a quorum uh, at that meeting. We had a presentation uh, regarding Connect services and how those uh, are able to help pair people with organizations and, and get referrals a little smoother to hopefully help connect people with what they need and find what they need in their area. Uh, we did not have any recommendations at this time. Uh, one of the main things we discussed uh, or brought up again was language access. And it sounds like DMS is a few different things that they're working on uh, and meeting with people to, to try to hone in on that area. Um, I think we may uh, ask for a presentation on that at our next uh, meeting, Dr. Burke. So I'm glad that you all are talking about it. That language access has come up. If you remember at our last MAC meeting, you know, some of the MCOs weighed in and said they were doing some things. Uh, mm -hmm. I think we really need to look at an overall picture of what's out there. Because uh, I know that providers, I remember Dr. Gupta had specifically asked, you know, if I'm in my office and somebody comes in and, and you know, I need language access right then, which is often what happens to providers. Who do I turn to? And it's expensive. Some of the uh, services I think are expensive. So. Yeah. Uh, Will you be meeting again before the March MAC meeting? No, our next meeting is on April 17th. Ah, okay. All right. So uh, we may look at uh, language access either for March or our next meeting after that, because I'd really like to get input from you all. I yeah, they've provided us. Issue. Sorry, go ahead. I just started to say, I think it's a huge issue, obviously, for people for whom English is not their first language and so forth. Yeah, the MCOs have uh, previous in previous meetings have, have sent us some resources or like presentations regarding what current uh, things they do offer regarding language access, and so that would maybe something that they could go ahead and send to you to to look at beforehand. But uh, yeah, right. it is something we've talked about frequently. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, and EMS. I'm sorry. I was just going to say, Dr. Schuster, this is Aaron. If the MAC is interested in seeing that information, I can go ahead and gather that up and send it out to you. That would be great, Aaron, if you would do that, because then I think we could decide what other information or what specific questions we want answered uh, in a presentation on that. I think that would be very helpful. Thank you. Um, EMS, and I think the... Keith Smith is on. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Dr. Schuster. Um, the EMS tag did meet. We've had an ongoing project um, happening with um, the MCOs along with DMS about changing the prior authorization system that we had for EMS. It was creating some serious financial hardships for our EMS providers because those prior authorizations would need it to have been turned in before the transport take place. However, in many cases, our EMS providers may have 30 minutes notification that a transport needs to take place, which means they didn't have an opportunity to get the, the PAN. Uh, working with the MCOs through DMS, we've been able to change that uh, system, and we basically adopted the Medicare system of using the physician certification statement form that EMS is very familiar with. Uh, all of the MCOs agreed to use that, and we had set uh, January 1st as the go-live date. A few of the MCOs weren't able to get everything in, in order. However, they have agreed to retro back to uh, January 1st so that if we have any EMS providers that had a claim uh, that far back that uh, they would still get coverage. So 
the the TAC wanted to make sure to recognize uh, the MCOs, um, DMS, especially uh, Aaron and Kelly for all the work they've done to support us. Uh, it has been a tremendous improvement for EMS for us to be able to get this change. Um, and we couldn't have asked for better partners uh, in, in getting this done. The one thing that I, I would like to pass on to get on everybody's radar, this is not in the form of a recommendation or anything, this is mainly just informational, is, and I, I hate using this word because it sounds dire, but it, it's we're, we're getting to this point. We are starting to see some collapse of EMS in Kentucky. We've got multiple counties now that have no paramedics that are on duty in the counties. Um, we've been contacted by several county agencies uh, at the Kentucky Board of EMS, um, notifying us that they intend to drop from advanced life support to basic life support only because they are not able to find paramedics to hire or they're not able to pay paramedics enough to be able to keep them in the region to be able to work. Uh, the Board of EMS is working um, as carefully as possible with the legislature, along with uh, the Kentucky Ambulance Providers Association, um, along with a, a few other organizations to see what we can do. We have um, recommended legislation to go before uh, the state in order to get more educational opportunities available for students to become paramedics. Um, but one of the biggest issues that we've got is compensation for paramedics. A lot of people don't understand this or realize it, but uh, to become a paramedic in the state of Kentucky, you go through as much education as what a registered nurse goes through, except pay in Kentucky can be anywhere from $16 an hour up to $35 to $40 an hour, depending on what part of the state you're in and what the agency can afford to pay. So we've really got a, a deck that is stacked against us in, in some of these smaller communities. So uh, again, wanted to make sure we put this on everybody's radar uh, to let you know that, that we are in a very trying time in EMS and uh, we, we do support um, and appreciate all of the, the work that DMS has done with us and for us uh, with, with the TAC. And uh, the only other thing to report is that we are switching from a bi-monthly meeting to a quarterly meeting as well. So uh, going forward, we'll be meeting on a quarterly basis unless we need to call a special meeting in between. But that, that's the end of my report. Thank you very much, Keith. Um, please keep us posted and I'm sure you will, will continue to talk about the uh, what you're calling the collapse of the system, but certainly if the paramedics are not available, uh, those services are not gonna be available. So I'm sure you will keep that, but we really need to stay on top of that. And I'd be, uh, what's the bill? Do you have a bill number on the- uh, we, We've got several. We, we've got House Bill 57, which is one that we really need to have go through. Uh, we've also been working with uh, Kentucky Hospital Association. They have a super speeder bill that they are trying to, to find a uh, sponsor for that would provide uh, funding for EMS education. And we have a workforce development bill uh, that we have written uh, we actually, we had one of the, the House members allow their uh, bill writer to work with us. Uh, we're still looking for a sponsor. It looks like we're going to get a sponsor this week. Uh, I don't have a number for that particular bill yet. Um, okay. I can email it to you once we know what it is. Um, but if, if we could get any assistance uh, through the legislature uh, in getting these bills, we have got to get more places um, performing uh, paramedic education. And, and to that point, we're even having a hard time finding EMTs anymore. Uh, so it's it it is a it's it's not a good time to be in EMS, quite honestly, with with the challenges that we have. So anytime that we get a victory like we just had with the uh, uh, prior certification system, uh, statement uh, change, right. the it, prior authorization, yeah, yeah. Yes, if you will send me those bills, I'd I'd be interested in tracking those and letting people. No, you know, I've been involved with EMS out of work because of the issues we ran into with um, transporting behavioral health patients and mm -hmm. so forth. So I'm very interested. And I think we all are certainly concerned that we don't want that system to fall apart. So we appreciate yes, that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Garth, you're up. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, the uh, the dental tech did not meet 
yet. We are meeting the first part of February, so we don't have any report. We don't have any recommendations right now, uh, other than I just did want to thank Commissioner Lee and, and her, the staff uh, for all the help that they have given Dental on the you know our day-to-day -day operations and uh, appreciate their willingness to take phone calls and emails and uh, pigeon flights too. So, uh, but I, I do have a uh, I do have a couple of recommendations, but I I'm gonna I'll move that down to uh, number eight as possible topics for future uh, meetings. So I'll, I'll I won't include that in my dental report just yet. Thank All you. Right. Thank you. Uh, I see my friend Emily Beauregard is on consumer rights and patient needs. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, the consumer attack met on December 14th. Uh, we met remotely and we had a quorum present. And I just want to um, reiterate that we are really pleased with uh, Medicaid's response to a previous recommendation that we made related to network adequacy. Commissioner Lee mentioned it earlier um, to create a process for beneficiaries to report when they're unable to access an in-network provider within time and distance standards. We think this will make a really big difference in how we understand the adequacy of our provider network um, and where there are gaps. Uh, and where we need to really focus attention on making sure that <clears throat> there are providers that are able and willing to um, see Medicaid members. And we are really looking forward to seeing what that um, report looks like. Just for context, the current process is that an individual can call their MCO, but no information is then you know, passed along to DMS. So DMS hasn't really been able to measure this and this will give us new data um, that we can work with. I um, also want to recognize Kelly Sheets for her work on an orientation packet for new MAC and TAC members. Um, that was another recommendation that we had made um, last year. And I think this is going to be incredibly helpful education, not just for new members, honestly, but any um, current members as well who just need a little bit more context and um, to better understand how um, the Medicaid program operates, um, some of the policies that um, we aren't all aware of when we're not doing this work on a daily basis. <clears throat> and um, we're reviewing a draft of that now. We're gonna provide some feedback at our February meeting, but hopefully there'll be something um, to share soon. And I believe that this is going to be uh, an orientation packet that every TAC and MAC and the entire MAC can take advantage of. Um, during our December meeting, we checked in on the status of Medicaid renewals and updates related to the 1915C waivers. Um, we discussed a number of other issues that we typically do, including language access. So I'm glad that that came up again. Dr. Schuster, I think that your idea for having a, a presentation at one of the upcoming MAC meetings is a good one. Um, we're looking at language access, not only in terms of, um, you know, other languages spoken, but also the needs of people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Uh, and so we're going to have a number of recommendations, I believe, that we'll be making in February. Um, we also discussed the need for housing supports um, and opportunities for more stakeholder input related to measuring access and quality just on a kind of ongoing basis. Um, there are so many great initiatives that the cabinet or you know Medicaid specifically has going on right now related to quality and really looking at um, social determinants of health, looking at um, you know just where we can really make an impact on health outcomes and it would be, I think, really helpful if we had more of a standard process in place um, for our, us to be aware of what those initiatives are, but also to have input on a regular basis. Um, one high, high priority issue that we discussed uh, was related to Medicaid renewals for people who are being processed um, ex parte, which essentially means it, it's passive. There's no action required on the Medicaid member's part. That's what the ex parte term means. Um, and, you know, looking at how we're determining it, whether someone is ineligible based on information that the state has access to through the federal hub and other sources. Um, so the ex parte process is supposed to be used 
when the state has sufficient information to make a determination and the state is able to determine that someone is eligible and can you know, stay enrolled in Medicaid through ex parte with no action taken on the member's part. But on the flip side, it can't only use the ex parte process if they determine that someone is no longer Medicaid eligible and then you know, would go on to terminate their coverage. In that scenario, the individual should be receiving something like, a, um, we call it a, <clears throat> either a, a full packet or a request for information, an RFI, um, to verify that the data that the state is using is accurate, is up to date, and is complete. Uh, and so we have heard some cases that, you know, people didn't receive an RFI or that packet to complete in order to verify their information and they were automatically transitioned uh, to a qualified health plan. Now, of course, that's not a seamless transition. You're only told you may be eligible, you can apply for a qualified health plan. So technically you are just losing Medicaid and becoming uninsured in that scenario. Um, but they receive a notice in the mail that says, we think you're eligible for a qualified health plan. Okay. If you think this is a mistake, then you can appeal that decision. Um, but what we really want is to ensure that anyone who has been determined in this ex parte process to likely be ineligible to be getting that request for information or that packet so that they can complete it. And that's something that where we made a recommendation about at our last meeting. And that recommendation is that DMS ensure that anyone going through the ex parte renewal process is not passively terminated without first receiving a request for information or a renewal packet to confirm that all data being used by DMS to determine their eligibility is up to date and accurate. So that was the only recommendation that we meet, made at our last meeting. Um, in addition to that, I just want to also uh, mention that there is a regulation that's open right now on non-emergency medical transportation services, and this regulation um, will be open for public comment until the end of this month. And you know, there are some really um, relatively minor, but also very helpful and important changes made in the regulation to. Um, hopefully provide more access to non-emergency medical transportation to Kentuckians. We've heard the commissioner present in past meetings that transportation is the number one barrier reported whenever people no-show for an appointment. We know there's national data that suggests that, you know, 60% of Medicaid members have a transportation barrier. Um, and so it's an area where I think we can make a lot of improvements and really help individuals get to the appointments that they need um, and remove that barrier for them if we can take better advantage of that program. So we always like, I, I'm just offering that in case you weren't aware um, and want to make a comment on how um, this regulation, the changes, you know, will be useful, but we can also always use these opportunities to talk about other improvements. So um, with that, I'll wrap up. Um, our next meeting is set for February 20th at 1.30 p.m. Eastern time, and it will be remote on Zoom. Thank you very much, Emily. So we have that recommendation that we'll take action on uh, in just a minute. Thank you very much. And I'm glad to hear that the language access, I know you've mentioned that in, in other um, reports, uh, really important. Um, children's health. Donna. I don't think Donna was going to be able to be with us today. They did have a meeting in January. Okay. And they also decided to go quarterly. Okay. So no report and no recommendations. No, ma'am. Okay. They meet again in April, I believe. Okay. Thank you and behavioral health, and I'm here. <clears throat> so we met on January 11th, and all seven of our voting members were present. We had Commissioner Lee there and we uh, from DMS, and we had Commissioner Marks from uh, the Department for Behavioral Health, Developmental and Intellectual Disabilities, and uh, the MCOs, as well as a good number of people from the behavioral health uh, community. We spent a lot of time getting reports um, 
uh, in detail about all of the waivers that we've been following because so many of our people are affected, particularly by these new waivers that are being rolled out. The 1915 um, I, the 1115s, the reentry, and so forth. And so we were pleased with the progress, and you all heard a lot of that earlier today. We had an ongoing, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, discussion about rates, and Victoria Smith with the Office of Data Analytics came and talked to us about how these studies are conducted, that they actually take every one of the uh, billing codes listed in the behavioral health fee schedule and do a comparison with other states about their uh, rates and any uh, regulations about how they are to be billed. And we're going to have a complete uh, a report from her and her staff uh, at our March meeting about the results of that study. So we're excited about that. Um, Justin Deringer uh, is the one that has reported on the no-show uh, portal. And again, I would really urge you all to, who represent providers, to urge your providers to report no-shows into that portal. And Justin is going to uh, give us a report in March about how much it's being used by behavioral health providers. Uh, Leslie gave us a, um, an update on uh, the mobile crisis. One of the things she pointed out was interesting. I thought 112 of our 120 counties are designated, I guess, federally as rural. So think about that, folks. Uh, 112 of 120 counties. And that's why they're doing these grants that she described for the co-response in the more rural areas and so forth. Um, we got the PowerPoint on Medicaid unwinding, which was all, is always um, uh, of interest. We have been pursuing uh, getting a better handle on Medicaid billing for students who are in school. And you know, uh, there's been a huge uh, emphasis on ever since the Marshall County shooting in 2018, and I think the anniversary for that was either yesterday or the day before. So we lost two students and several were um, injured. And out of that came a work group and then Senate Bill 1 in 2019 and Senate Bill 8 in 2020. And the emphasis was not only on kind of what they call the hardening of the schools, you know, uh, better security, um, doors being closed and all the outdoors, outside doors being locked and a central entrance and so forth. And the SROs, um, the security uh, officers and so forth, but a lot of emphasis on what we call the heart and that is the behavioral health part. And one of the things is that we know that if a, any student has at least one adult in the school that they feel comfortable with, and it could be a teacher, it could be the school nurse, it could be um, a lunchroom person, it could be the bus driver. If they hear something, they will say something. And that's really what we want. That's what really uh, circumvents some of these threats and some of the uh, safety issues. So we've been very focused now on Medicaid billing for school-based mental health services. And Justin Nierger has uh, reported on that. Uh, Deputy, uh, Senior Deputy Commissioner Judy Veronica, uh, Veronica Judy Cecil has emphasized that Medicaid really wants to see billing uh, happening in the schools. And it can happen from the uh, employees who are mental health professionals, but it also can happen from contracted community employees. So we are following up on that and hoping to have a report about what that billing looks like. Um, we had no new recommendations um, to the MAC uh, Aaron distributed to us an update to the MCO provider complaint form, and we made that available to the BHTAC. Aaron, we might want to send that out. Did you send that out to all the MAC people as well? I apologize. I was reading an email. Which uh, yeah, report? I, was, I was just asking about the updated uh, MCO provider complaint form. I did. I sent that out to an email blast to um, all MAC and TAC okay. members, but I'm happy to resend it if someone did not receive it. You all remember seeing it. <laughs> you know, you get a million, a, a million emails. 
I just, I'll make note to resend it. Yeah, let's resend it now that we've talked about it. People might look for it. Um, <laughs> and we also have an ongoing issue with our uh, targeted case management reg um, and the way that it's being possibly misinterpreted by an MCO who's trying to recoup lots of money from a provider. And DMS has been very helpful in trying to address that. So we had no recommendations and our next meeting will be on uh, March 14th. So um, I believe we had uh, one recommendation. So I would entertain a motion to accept that TAC recommendation and send it along to DMS. So moved. Second. Right. Garth and um, Kent, thank you very much. Any questions? That was the one from the consumer uh, TAC about ex parte um, unwinding practices. All those in favor of uh, sending that uh, recommendation forward to DMS signify by saying aye. 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 And opposed? And abstaining. Great. Thank you very much. Did any of our uh, MAC members have any follow-up questions for Humana, Passport, or United? If you remember, we had all three of them uh, give a present, give their presentations in the November meeting. And I just want to be sure if there were any questions, because we did not have time for any questions at, at that time. Anybody have any follow-up question for them? Seeing none, um, I sent out an email to the MAC members and I had tried to list some of the things that I had been hearing at that last meeting and in other meetings as possible topics for future MAC meetings. And we had language access, network adequacy, uh, the DMS rate setting for providers, um, a general thing on patients' rights. And then I think there was an issue that was raised about Medicare Advantage plans. Um, Garth, you said that you had perhaps something you wanted to add in that category. Uh, yes. Uh, uh, one, well, number one, the, uh, uh, I know so different uh, boards do have different criteria for licensureship, and, and I didn't know if uh, uh, the MAC uh, gave out any certificates to the, to the MAC members uh, for participation in these meetings. I know like I said, some boards do uh, for this type of meeting. Uh, it is very informational and, I mean, very related to the public health of Kentucky. Uh, the second thing, and I, I briefly talked with Commissioner Lee about this. I, it's just a, an idea. Of, I, I mentioned to her one day about, uh, well, maybe we ought to add a tack. Uh, and nobody likes to add work to ourselves, but... Uh, uh, and I, my thought was on nutritional health, um, and that that affects most of our jobs. Um, the or or even have the MCOs uh, with their networks already established uh, work on that. As you all know, there's a huge increase in obesity uh, and diabetes and other health issues, even in our field of dental. Um, and I I know the you know, the, the soft drink industries and uh, some of these food industries don't want to hear us talk about it, but, you know, uh, sometimes our food choice decisions are really hurting us in the long run. Uh, a new one that has become uh, knowledge to me was, uh, of course, as a dentist, I know the candy and the sugar is not good, especially for our children and some of our adults with dry mouth problems. But, the the candies are are always or not always uh, they're in primary colors, kind of geared towards our children and grandchildren, um, and some of these colors these dyes are loaded like with uh, red forty red lake forty yellows blues greens, um, and they're finding that a lot of these are. Uh, causing young children to be labeled as ADHD or ADD. Um, once they get labeled, then they are uh, given medicine for those situations. 
but some so many of them have, and our pediatric uh, physician that I've been talking to with this just so I get more knowledge myself uh, notices these things and once they get them off these uh, red and blue candies and Gatorades uh, boy their ADHD symptoms calm down or almost go away so I, I just uh, I didn't know if this was something that uh, we, we need to even look for or look forward to I know um, you know, we, even though we're in, in Medicaid, all these funds come from, you know, our, our taxpayers. And, and I feel like we have a responsibility to use these funds to our, our benefit. And I think the uh, ultimate goal is to improve the health of our Kentuckians at any age. Uh, and uh, I know Commissioner Lee said, well, when she started it, I think our Kentucky's overall uh, health was in the 49th category, uh, is down to 43, and is, and is now 41. And she said, well, she'd like to see us get into the 30s over the next four years. So I think that's a lofty goal. And uh, nutritional issues are, uh, I'm sorry, just, you know, well, I, my, my wife fixes stuff the way her mama fixed stuff, you know. Her mama fixed stuff the way her mama fixed stuff. And uh, I'll tell you a story one other day about, well, grandma, great grandma fixed it because that way, because that's the only pan she had. Uh, so uh, I'll tell you the rest of that story on another day. But uh, anyway, I just thought I'd bring that, uh, uh, the nutritional aspect up. And if there's any way that we can incorporate that as a, a MAC project, that's fine. Or if you want to let it go, that's fine too. I just wanted to bring it to awareness, but thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Garth. Um, on your first issue, you're talking about getting uh, continuing education credit for participating in, in these meetings. Is that what mm -hmm. you're asking? Yeah, I didn't, yes. I, and I didn't know if, uh, uh, if if we just uh, if those that can get CE credit, if all they would have to do is show the uh, agenda, or if they might need a, uh, a, a like a printed certificate from DMS um, to just show that we were on the call today, and um, I, just an idea for some credit hours. Okay. Um... Let's think about that. Um, you know, the boards vary greatly in terms of what they will accept for CE, and I don't want to put a lot of um, work on our DMS folks. Typically, um, CEs to be approved have to state objectives for the learning experience. So we'd have to really think about what the objectives are in terms of furthering the education of, of a provider, whether it's a dental provider or an optometric or a pharmacy or physician, or in my case, a psychology provider. So let's, uh, maybe we can talk about that offline, Garth, and see what we want to do about that, okay? Um, yeah, thank you. Yeah, um, you know, on the on the TAC, and I, uh, uh, Dr. Gupta put, uh, you know, uh, a positive comment about, yes, nutrition is so much the basis of some of our poor health. I'm thinking that uh, one of the themes for this year for the MAC might be to think about, uh, you know, uh, our makeup and the makeup of the tax are all driven by legislation. So we're not going to do anything this legislative session. But I would really like to see us set as a goal to be ready for the 2025 legislative session if we want any changes in the makeup of the MAC, or if we want to add or modify any of the tax. Uh, some of the tax have mentioned to me that they would like to see their uh, makeup of their voting members uh, be handled differently. For instance, uh, maybe they need to add more members or they need to take some members off or it's difficult to get a quorum, some of those issues. And uh, actually, one of the things that Commissioner Lee and I had talked about because it, it, she said it was raised at one of her national meetings is that the MACs in most states have a legislative representation on it. 
so that you would put into statute that a legislator and suggest perhaps it be the chair of the House and the chair of the Senate uh, Health Services Committee, for instance. Um, and I think it's something that we ought to explore. I know that she was asked at a, a reg review committee meeting by the legislators on that committee, well, what is the map? You know, you talk about the map, we don't know anything about it. What do they do? And I think there's probably a big disconnect because we're kind of over here in the Medicaid world and then the legislators are over there in the General Assembly world and they ask for uh, testimony, certainly from the cabinet and DMS but in terms of all of us being involved in this process and vetting things and making recommendations, there really is a disconnect. So that's one of the things we might think about. Uh, we uh, you know, might think about uh, are all of the Medicaid recipients um, and all the categories of Medicaid recipients well represented and are there other provider groups? And I guess one could be uh, nutritionists and dietitians actually, uh, Garth, along your uh, suggestion about nutrition. Obviously, we could also schedule a presentation on, you know, some general nutritional topics. So I think it's well worth um, thinking about. Um, and I appreciate your thinking about that. Are there any other suggestions for our list for many of the MAC members? I think I'm leaning toward the language access because it's come up so uh, so often. So let's see what uh, Aaron can pull together from some of those presentations and see whether we might be ready to have something in, in uh, March. And we will share all of that with you. And then I'll send an email out to the MAC members. I do hope that the tax will keep in mind the mobile crisis. Obviously, EMS and, and some of the tax are natural to but uh, if the other tax uh, have any um, experiences to report, I think it would be helpful for DMS to have that information as well. Um, are there any items of new business for many of the MAC members? All right. Well, if we adjourn real fast, we can finish four minutes early, which has hardly not happened. <laughs> in a long time. So I appreciate you all getting on early. Uh, we obviously needed the three hours, but at least the, the TAC members, I think, had a little bit more time to do their reports and so forth. And uh, um, if there are no um, further items of business, uh, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. I so move. Second. Yeah. <laughs> and Kathy, thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to assume that we're uh, adopting that motion by acclamation. So uh, thank you all for your um, for your participation, and uh, we'll see you in uh, two months. Our next meeting is March 28th, 9:30 to 12:30 Eastern Time. Stay thank warm you. and healthy, and thank you very much. Bye bye. <laughs>